Blackman for tonight, February 2nd, 3rd, 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 3rd 2015. <laughs> um, Selectman <coughs> Daly, I believe, will be joining us shortly. Selectman Wyshynski will be participating remotely. We've gone through the checklist and uh, pursuant to the board's authority under state law and in accordance with regulation 940 CMR 2910 subsection 8, Selectman Neil Wyshynski will be participating in a portion of this evening's, even, evening's meeting remotely via telephone to, to his geographic distance from Brookline. There is a quorum. Somewhere for warm. Yeah, and all votes will be taken. Taken will be by recorded roll call when he's participating remotely. He's not, by the way, participating remotely at this moment, but will be later. And uh, we wish him a uh, slow return from Florida and enjoy <laughs> A successful weekend. return. No, a successful, but <laughs> maybe if he can get snowed in for another day, then yeah. he can get a nice tan. Yeah, I had the distinct so. impression that Logan was cleared in order for the Patriots to get back and everybody else was stuck. <laughs> I could be wrong about that. So um, that is, uh, I'm sorry, I left my agenda in the other room. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's uh, first item of business, and uh, now we go to our first agenda item, which is uh, announcements and updates. Selectman DeWitt. Well, it is Climate Week, um, and I can't decide whether the snow is a result of some climate change or not. But, um, and unfortunately, it's uh, very close to uh, time for it to start, but tonight at the Coolidge Corner Theater, uh, there will be a presentation about innovative ideas in local transportation having to do with um, uh, saving energy. Um, and on Sunday, there's a full schedule ev of events, including a kickoff party that will be from 5 until 7 p.m. this Sunday at the Brookline Teen Center. Um, and there will be uh, plenty of people there to answer questions about clean electricity, uh, how to participate in the Massachusetts Energy, Energy Consumers Alliance, um, and um, the um, sort of early, I think, uh, one of the early uh, proponents of uh, people taking proper action with regard to uh, conservation of energy, uh, former Governor Michael Dukakis, I gather, will also be present. Um, anyway, you can find out all of the events. Um, there's a brochure that was uh, freely available in Town Hall and in many other places. And the website is www.brooklineclimateweek.org. And also this week, uh, at the Brookline Library Foundation Midwinter Mingle will begin on Sunday right after the uh, kickoff at the Brookline, the Climate Action kickoff at the Teen Center uh, at the uh, main library on Sunday from 7 until 10 p.m. Uh, there will be live music and entertainment and tickets are available online at www.brooklinelibrary.org. Good. I want to offer my congratulations to Brookline residents Thomas Brady and uh, Robert Kraft, Jonathan Kraft, who were involved in some kind of sporting event this weekend and I believe uh, won the Super Bowl. So um, and congratulations the snow. to make us proud. Yeah. Maybe they'll come here and uh, show off their trophies for us. That would be nice. <laughs> um, I'm sure Board of Selectmen meetings are high yeah, on their yeah, exactly. schedule. Um, I also want to take a moment to announce publicly that I will not be seeking re-election in this uh, spring's uh, town election, and uh, I'm joining Selectman DeWitten in uh, retirement, early retirement. I've enjoyed every moment of serving on this board, but uh, right now, for personal reasons, I need to devote more attention to my other job and my family. and. Uh, and uh, good luck without me. And good luck, anyone listening. Anyone listening who wants to run, uh, you know, you've got uh, a short window of time right now to file your nomination papers. And uh, if anyone ever wants to talk to me about my experience with it, I'd be glad to share it and encourage you to to, to do it. Um, 
and just so you know, I have pulled papers for uh, town meeting member in my precinct too. So you haven't seen the last. <laughs> Good for one. you. That's right. We'll have you to kick around again. You still have yes. still have Ken Goldstein to kick around. Exactly right. Well, uh, I, I I think we will miss having you, and I think your voice of reason and balance has been very much appreciated by all of us. So. Um, we need somebody who can fill those shoes. Thank you, Betsy. That, that is true. We are going to miss uh, both of you. And um, it's a seasoned selectman who understand a lot of the issues around here. So um, thank you, Nancy. Thank you for your service. Thank you. All right. Anything else in the public comment arena? No. Yep. We did have um, Joanna Baker signed up for a public comment, but I don't see her here. Anybody see Joanna Baker? So I'm guessing we can skip that. And with that, with that, we will move on to our miscellaneous calendar. And the first miscellaneous item, item A, is the question of approving the minutes of the January 30th, 2015 meeting. I had uh, no revisions on that one. Uh, I, I didn't on that one, but I would like to hold the two sets of minutes on the hearings because there a lot of people commented on which version of the debt exclusion um, they liked the Franco Daily plan or the other one, and at some some not a number of those didn't get into the minutes. What oh. sp specifically what they'd said about which plan sure. they liked? Okay. And so I would I, I have notes on it somewhere. I can probably correct it. I just was shoveling snow today instead. Mm -hmm. of, All right, uh, that'll be fine. So I had some edits to the uh, the regular selectmen's meeting from the twentieth. Good. So the Franco's edits are passed down to the secretary. And, uh, and I think that's the only the only edit. So uh, I move that we approve the minutes of January 20th, 2015, as amended. All in favor say aye. Selectman DeWitt. I'm sorry, Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. She votes aye. And uh, we're going to hold the approval of the minutes from the two override public hearing minute uh, public hearings on January 20th and just January 22nd. Uh, next is agenda item C under miscellaneous. It's the question of approving change order number one and the amount of $34,728.71 for work in connection with the old Lincoln School renovation project. Mr. Quigley. Good evening. Uh, as you uh, stated, this is change order number one. Net increase of $34,728.71 to the contract between the Town of Brookline Lambert and Construction Corp. This change order has been approved by both the Building Commission and School Committee. And this consists of uh, changes to the flooring scope, uh, additional um, plumbing and electrical work, uh, and some various credits and reductions in the hazardous materials abatement work. Um, the biggest item is changes to the flooring scope um, the scope called for removal of layers of built-up flooring and refinishing of wood floors underneath. In some cases, there was additional layers of flooring that uh, were just buried underneath and were not uh, contained in the contract. And in other cases, the um, in some cases, this is uh, 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 the flooring was asbestos-containing material, uh, non-friable. And uh, <clears throat> when it was removed, uh, it was found that the mastic, in some cases, had actually permeated the wood floors, which precluded um, refinishing of them. So the solution was to encapsulate with plywood and put vinyl floor on. So the, uh, as I said, between all the credits and ads, the net increase is $34,728.71. Tony, when I hear about asbestos in a school, I, I, my, my alarm bells ring a little bit. Is there any hazard that can be appreciated uh, no. as a result of having this substance there? I know it's probably glued in place and it's, uh, it's, it's not fraying, it's not crumbling. No, no, tell, it's, tell this, in this case it was um, you know, wood, hardwood floors. Over the years, uh, tile had been installed. So there's actually layers of built-up flooring. And in some cases, some of that tile, which was fairly common back then, actually very common, uh, contained asbestos uh, materials in it. Uh, the nature of it is that it's non-friable. So it's not, a, uh, it's not a material that's gonna become airborne. Uh, but the scope of work was to try and get down to the uh, wood floors. And the mastic, again, in some cases, has actually seeped into the floors 
but those floors will have um, plywood over them and new tile. So there's absolutely no chance of that becoming an issue. Okay. It's reassuring. Thank you. Sir, I'm it. Um, I, just a general question about the renovation work at Old Lincoln. Uh, are you comfortable that it's moving ahead on target and there are no um, other, uh, let's say, unanticipated events that have been discovered? There are unanticipated events, and there will be a lot of them owing to the nature of the work uh, uh, because we're sort of doing this piecemeal and it's an old school. Right. Uh, but I'm confident that um, uh, the budget will address all of these, and I'm also confident that we will uh, finish on schedule. Okay. My, my question in, in part is to do with, obviously, other projects are dependent on having Old Lincoln available um, in a timely fashion. Yeah, right now, uh, as I said, at the, there's nothing that tells me right now that we're, we're, we wouldn't meet the schedule. And as I said, as the issues come up, uh, we've got a very good contractor and subcontractors and a design team, and we take them head on. And we'll okay. address them and we'll That's them good news. Glad to hear it. Tony, I want to ask you also about the item that was part of this, uh, which is the decision to reuse the existing burner in the in the, the furnace there. So I know we've been going, especially in our school buildings, and um, changing the burners and making them flex fuel, I guess, so that they could burn gas or oil, I, th I think. And if I remember what Charlie told us at one point, uh, we not upgrading this burner the same way we've been upgrading other burners? This is a new burner that was, it's only a couple of years old. And the reason we came about the, this boiler is being changed out. And it was, it's, it's, it was thought to be an eight section boiler, but it's actually a 10 section boiler. The, all the markings on the boiler was an eight section boiler. So the new, the new burner that we had spec'd out won't work for this boiler. So the thought was, it's only a couple of years old, we'll just reuse that existing burner yes. and it's, it's efficient and it will certainly. So it's a new burner. Okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Anything further? All right, well I move that we uh, approve change order number one in the amount of $34,728.71 for work to be performed by Lumbarian Construction in connection with the Old Lincoln School Renovation Project. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item D under miscellaneous, we have the question of approving change order number two in the amount of $3,034.63 in connection with the Lawrence School Classroom Addition. Mr. Quigley. Yes, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, this change order number two, again approved by both Building Commission and School Committee. Uh, this consists of two items. It's a relocation of electrical items in car to 203 to accommodate the new work. Uh, the cost of that is $3,334.63. And then there's a small credit for utility usage in $300. So the net increase to the contract is $3,034.63 if, if approved by you this evening. Good. Any questions? All right, I move that we approve. Wait, just oh, one second, though. Yep. If one's a credit, why are we adding them together? Well, the net add is $3,334.63 minus $300 is $3,034.63. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So I move that we approve change order number two in the amount of $3,034.63 for work be, to be performed by GVW Inc. in connection with the Lawrence School Classroom Edition. All in favor, say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Chair votes aye. Moving on, question E is the uh, question of approving and executing contract amendment number eight in the amount of $4,900 in connection with the Lawrence School Classroom Edition project. Mr. Woodley, again. This is uh, one item, uh, again approved by Building Commission School Committee. This relates to the um, soils uh, abatement that we had talked about 
uh, in the fall, and uh, there were contract amendments associated with that. At one point, we estimated 600 tons of soil would be impacted. The actual account to date is 1,018 tons, and the $4,900 is to account for that difference uh, in the removal of the soils from the site. Okay. Any questions? Selectman Franco. How is it that we were off by so much, and can we expect it? to discover further material that needs to be removed. We will likely have further material in the, in the spring when we do the site work. However, uh, because we, w we just estimated until you really start digging, you don't know how extensive it is, unfortunately. So. Okay. Uh, I move that we approve and execute a contract amendment, which would be amendment number eight in the amount of $4,900.34 with Flansburg Associates in connection with the Lawrence School Classroom Edition Project. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Chair votes aye. Uh, agenda item F under miscellaneous is the question of approving and executing a contract amendment number three in the amount of $16,775 in connection with the Devotion School Renovation and Edition Project. Mr. Gridley. Mr. Chairman, this is contract amendment number three to the contract with HMFH Con Architects uh, approved by school committee and building commission. And this consists of basically two items. Uh, it's additional geotechnical work and some uh, a small amount of arborist work for evaluation of uh, some historic trees at the Devotion House and, and surveyor work associated with that. That's the <coughs> smallest part of the amendment. Uh, this is in the ongoing geotechnical work and investigations in our efforts to learn as much as we can about the site in an effort to uh, stave off uh, unknowns that can lead to potential change orders during construction. And uh, we, there's an estimated amount of soil that's going to need to be removed from the site, and all of that has to be pre-characterized uh, according to regulations. And uh, this is the second part of that pre-characterization. We'll need to do some more of it uh, underneath the actual building. Uh, and then, as I indicated to you folks before, there is a uh, petroleum hydrocarbon uh, issue associated with the existing oil tank or the uh, supply lines to the building. Uh, we're all in keeping with the DEP. And in keeping with the DEP, we were required to do soil gas testing. So this is uh, the uh, contract amendment to address all of those issues. Okay. Questions? Good. Seems prudent to get out ahead on this one. So I uh, move that we approve and execute contract amendment number three in the amount of $16,775 which with HMFH Architects in connection with the Devotion School Renovations and Additions Project. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you, Tony. Ray, you next? Uh, item G is the question of awarding a contract in the amount of $117,850 to Eagle Point Builders in connection with the Fisher Hill Gatehouse windows and door renovation project. Mr. Masick. Yes, Mr. Chair. We received seven, seven bids for this project. The three lowest bids were very close, probably within plus or minus $4,000. And this is for all the windows at the uh, gatehouse that were restoring and stabilizing over at the Fisher Hill Park. Can you remind me, did we get a grant for some of this? Yes, we did. I think it was approximately $40,000. $40,000, and the, the remainder, the balance that's due, is it within our budget allotment for it? According to uh, Aaron Shue Galantine, it is. Good. Any questions? No, just a comment, and that is that I know Aaron was very carefully budgeting for all of these things, so I'm inclined to think she's, she was on top of it, and I agree with Ray. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, seeing no uh, objection, I'm going to move that we award a contract in the amount of $117,850 to Eagle Point Builders in connection with the Fisher Hill Gatehouse Windows and Door Renovation Project. All in favor say aye. Select them daily. Aye. Selectman Duet. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. And the chair votes aye. In item H, Mr. Papasturgeon. 
question of accepting a grant from the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, two grants, in fact, recycling dividends for $4,200 for waste and recycling expenditures and targeted small-scale initiatives um, as well. So, Mr. Papasturgeon, the commission on this. finished it. <laughs> I, need, I need to understand what targeted small-scale initiatives are, but you these tell are, us. These are all part of the DEP Sustainable Materials Recovery Program uh, grant that was put in place uh, several years ago. Uh, we've actually been awarded three grants. Uh, these two, which are relatively small, we have a third grant uh, that we've been uh, uh, awarded conditionally, uh, and that's for the $200,000 for the uh, pay-as-you-throw cuts. But uh, we haven't received that yet. But these two particular grants we have, uh, they are small. The first one is the $4,200, and that's in the Recycling Dividends Fund. I just should say that the, say that the Waste Materials Recovery Program takes proceeds from the sale of waste energy certificates uh, uh, and awards them to uh, recycling programs that have been approved by the Mass DEP. So this was as a result of a, uh, uh, this is a reward for us. Uh, the $4,200 is, is going to be used to offset the costs of uh, additional recycling cuts. Uh, and the $1,600 grant, which is the targeted small scale initiative, they, I don't know where they come up with the names, but uh, <laughs> that we have, have gotten in the past and we historically use that to offset the cost of composting bins for residents. Uh, we use it to cut the, co the retail cost in half uh, so that the bins normally sell for $80. We pick up $40 of that cost through this grant and then charge the residents the, the, uh, the remaining $40. So these are both good programs, the small amounts of money, uh, but the real prize will be coming at some point in the future with the uh, $200,000 grant. Very good. Questions? I, I, I was just going to say I, I, I'm very in favor of both of these and I uh, wish they were bigger, but on the other hand, uh, it, I think it's really important for a um, there be recognition for all of the effort that's going into this recycling. So, modest but important. I want to applaud you. We like receiving grants as opposed to spending money on it. So thank you for, for diligently tracking down uh, these these grant funds. Uh, I, I note in the, uh, the letter awarding us the $4,200 that it says that we've earned seven points, uh, and I presume that's out of a 10-point scale. It is. I'm wondering if there's low-hanging fruit that we could get um, to, to get eight or nine or 10 points in the future. To be Perfect. honest with you, I have no idea how okay. to assign the points. <laughs> I think that we've pretty much grabbed at everything we could grab at. I don't know really what more we can do. We set up the Household Hazardous Waste Program. We have a very good uh, collection center up there for electronics. and and th those sort of things, free on recovery. So, you know, we've done all those things. We've received uh, awards from time to time. I'm really not sure what yep. more we could do, so. That's fair. And if a citizen wants to purchase a composting bin through this program, how do they do that? They just contact us. Uh, we, have, uh, we have the bins in stock, and, uh, and we will make uh, arrangements to get it to them. And it Are these the, the same black ones that? Yeah. Because my, um, you know, they, there's a little sort of grid area down near the bottom to let air circulate. The squirrels have eaten through oh, that to make a little opening for themselves to go in and help themselves to my composting. <laughs> and um, the um, I know one of my neighbors had some problems with rats near their compost. So it, I'm just wondering, um, I'll just throw that out there to you to maybe uh, think about when Spare parts? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm wondering if there's other composting bins that we might switch to in the future that would be a little more squirrel resistant. And the, the cost would be $40, or is that in half and it's $20? The, the cost to the residents is $40, yes. Uh, I move that we accept the following grants from the Department of Environmental Proje Protection, a recycling dividends grant for waste and recycling expenditures in the amount of $4,200, and a targeted small in in initiatives grant 
to offset costs for composting bins for residents in the amount of $1,600. All in favor of accepting those two grants say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is the question of approving and executing an extra work order, which would be number one in the amount of $18,100 in connection with the phase one dam inspection evaluation. Mr. Ditto. Good evening. Um, the Brookline Reservoir is classified as a dam by the Office of Dam Safety, and as such, we're required to have inspected every two years. Uh, last September, we contracted with the firm of tie and bond to do what they call a phase one inspection and evaluation. The result of that inspection was that the dam is in, is in good shape. There's no signs of seepage or weepage through the uh, earthen dam. However, what was noted on the report was that there was a lot of landscaping, trees on the, uh, on the earth berm. And for the Office of Dam Safety, that is a, a no-no. And basically, their solution to that is a clear cut the trees. A consultant made us aware of that. And that being said, we asked that the officials from the Office of Dam Safety come on site so they could see what a resource this area was for the town and possibly what other options might be available for a solution. After much talk back and forth, the uh, officials from the Office of Dam Safety suggested that the town have the consultant do a tree maintenance program, which would include, among other things, removing undergrowth, stump removal, root removal, slope restoration, and putting measures in to maintain the trees that are left in place. Um, they also said that um, instead of uh, submitting that report, which was due in December, that we asked for an extension. Because once that report, report goes in, that's gospel, and we didn't want to submit it under these conditions. So we did request a, uh, a waiver of that date, and they gave us a continuation date of June 12th. So, so we asked the... Um, consultant to put together a proposal to make this report a reality, and that's what the $18,100 is for. It's being funded from the capital account for stormwater improvements. Peter, is, is the, how much of the perimeter of the reservoir is, is dam? Is it the root it's nine part of it? It's only about one-third, the lower one-third of the of the berm is actually a dam. Anything above beyond that is actually the 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 earth behind the the berm is higher than the water, so it's not considered a dam. So, from approximately where to where, if you can find a way of describing it, would we expect to see the trees go away? Um, well, we don't expect them to go away. Yeah. That's what this is all well, about. Some trees go away. The, yeah, right? some's probably going to have to go. And my guess is that. It's going to be where the dam is at its most vulnerable, and that's down at the intersection of Walnut and Route 9, where the, I think it's about 19 foot difference between the top of the berm and the, uh, the roadway. Now, there aren't many trees at that part of the dam. There's not. Anyway. There are a couple of significant oaks, and um, we're going to see if we can save those. So it's, it's, um, we still got a lot of work to do and a lot of negotiation. Yeah. But to answer your question, I'd say if you are at the intersection, if the traffic signal, you go three to 400 feet west on Route 9, that would be where it changes from a dam into just earth. And then on the other side, on the Warren Street side, I'd say you go up maybe 200 feet, and that's where the, the lines cross. Got it. Serpent Daly? Yeah, um, well, I, I know many of my neighbors and, and I also like to go walk around the reservoir. And having the trees uh, is really important for shade in the summer. But in addition to that, the cherry trees, I know there was private fundraising that went on to plant a lot of those cherry trees. And um, people are going to be very upset if, I, I think we um, certainly need to, um, have advance warning if any trees are actually going to be removed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Um, but I, I, I would uh, urge you to, I, I mean, stump removal, pruning, undergrowth, clearing, you know, yeah. that that's all okay. But if yeah. we're talking about removing uh, living trees, I think there's going to be um, some upset. So um, I would certainly urge you to keep fighting on that. And if you need our help on, uh, in terms of testimony or letters or whatever, I'm sure we'd be happy to help with that. Uh, that that's exactly the way we felt also, is that this, this can't happen that way they, they, you know, the way they want to do it. And we, we even made the case to say, like, those cherry trees are on top of the berm. Yeah. And actually, their root structure doesn't even go down to the water level. So actually, it's above any kind of uh, zone where it would affect the, uh, the dam. So we're looking at all the possibilities to save the yeah. trees. Well, I mean, and I would suggest that the trees probably make the whole thing, the whole area more stable. Yeah. You know, you'd have more stuff washing into the... Right. Reservoir, et cetera, if you didn't have the trees in place. So. Exactly. So we do it. Just a, a bit of a follow up. I guess um, my understanding is that the uh, Parks and Open Space, Ms. Galantine, has been um, developing plans for work on the reservoir that involves stabilizing the. Um, I'm, I, I don't want to use the word dam here, but the. Um, the, 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 the <laughs> surrounding support, is that in any way related to this? Uh, it certainly will help. <clears throat> we have 80,000 in FY uh, 2017 yeah. for study, and then another 1.8 million in 2018 to implement it. But absolutely, uh, part of that program is going to be the slope stabilization. Right. So, yeah, and we're, my making, we're making this all known to the Office of Dam Safety. Okay. And then my, my real question is, what's the difference between this year and two years ago when apparently we were not being cited for having trees on our dam? That's a very good question. And the answer was the study two years ago was flawed. He, that study didn't recognize the uh, landscaping on the berm. Okay, in oh. the future, I think that's the kind <laughs> of that's we need to go back to. to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it, at any rate, I think the idea of uh, of studying this is our next yeah next best uh, alternative here, and seeing if we're going to preserve as much as possible. So, um, I therefore uh, move that we approve and execute extra work order number one in the amount of eighteen thousand one hundred dollars <coughs> to be performed by tie and bond in connection with contract number PW15-14, phase one dam inspection and evaluation. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. We have two uh, temporary alcoholic beverage licenses to consider. Uh, the first is an event to be held on February 6, 2015 at 15 Newton Street, the Lousy Anderson Auto Museum. Dancing with the Cars, from 6.30 <laughs> to 11 p.m. Very clever. And uh, the second is uh, the aforementioned um, gala fundraiser for the um, public library uh, to be held on February 8, 2015, from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the main library, 361 Washington Street. All in favor of those two temporary alcoholic beverages licenses, Please say aye, Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. The chair votes aye. That concludes our miscellaneous calendar. We're on to the uh, main calendar. And the first item is a discussion of uh, going to um, deficit spending on our snow and ice removal budget. But while we're, while we're at it, Commissioner Papasturgeon, um, I think it would be Good idea to brief us on uh, the, the massive operations that have been going on in the town for uh, snow and ice removal due to the severe weather we've had in the last ten week. Ten weeks. I think we have uh, Selectman Wyshynski arriving. And I'll know for anyone who wasn't listening before that we've already uh, made the necessary procedural steps to include remote participation by Selectman Wyshynski. Yes. Can you, you can hear us, Selectman Wyshynski? Neil, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Good. 
All right, we are on agenda item number five, and Commissioner Papasturgeon is going to be talking us to, about, to us about deficit spending for snow and ice removal, but before he does so, he will brief us on snow uh, and emergency operations in light of the last two snow events we've had. Commissioner Papasturgeon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you've heard me say many times before, we always prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Well, in this case, we prepared for the worst and we got it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the blizzard of uh, 2015, as, as it's called, uh, Storm Juno is its name, uh, began on uh, January 26th at 8 p.m. and concluded on January 28th at 9 a.m. for about a 37-hour duration, one of the longer ones that we've had to deal with. Uh, prior to this storm, for the whole winter season, we had only received about five inches of snow. Uh, so this was what we were hoping was going to be the, the winter that didn't exist. Uh, we were proved wrong on that. Uh, this particular storm, we, we recorded 30 inches of snow uh, up at the Municipal Service Center, which is generally where we measure these things. I think the official total might have been 29. Uh, but we did, in fact, record 30 inches of snow. At the height of the storm, we had 130 DPW employees that were on duty. In addition to that, we had 20 <coughs> private contractor employees uh, on duty for both snow plowing and for forestry operations. Uh, as you may remember, uh, this was also a wind event, uh, and we had to be prepared for down trees uh, within the public way uh, and power outages as well. Uh, thankfully, we had uh, very little of that this, for this storm. I think it was because the snow was lighter than they thought it was going to be, uh, which, was, which was good for us. We did have uh, 88 pieces of town snow fighting equipment on the road, and in addition to that, we had 16 contract pieces of equipment for a total of 104 uh, pieces of uh, snow fighting equipment. Uh, and that was on the road for the entire 37-hour duration. We did declare a snow emergency on uh, 11 p.m. on Monday, uh, and that lasted until 6 a.m. on Wednesday. Uh, the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, of course, was, is always activated when we have a, a declaration of snow emergency, and uh, coupled with that is a uh, parking ban on all of the public ways in town. The EOC <laughs> is used basically for a, a central dispatch operation for, for both DPW, police, and forestry operations and highway division operations in, ter in terms of snow plowing. Uh, we also uh, dispatch the calls for towing, for towing vehicles that are violating the parking ban, all from the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, we were thankful to have Selectman Goldstein tour our Emergency Operations Center during the uh, event this time. We were, we were happy to have you there, Ken. It was a pleasure and it was quite remarkable to see the, the effort and the the organization that, that goes behind this. I never appreciated it before. It is, it is well choreographed, uh, <laughs> I will say that, especially when you have that many men and, and equipment on the road. And a lot of pizza, too, also. <laughs> a lot of pizza, too. yes. You have, to, you have to put fuel in the vehicles. You also have to put fuel in the people, too. So uh, we use, uh, the town has a system that's called Blackboard Connect, and that's the system that we use for sending out the call that you all get uh, and listen to my voice at all odd hours of the day and night. Uh, and that has proved to be very effective in getting the word out uh, in terms of the parking ban notification. We also try to include special notifications, for instance, delays in trash pickup uh, or any other specialty things that we may, we think uh, we, we need to tell the residents about. And I think the message is, is getting out there because in this storm, for, for a 37 hour duration, uh, we only towed 12 cars. And that was town wide. So that, that's a that's a very good uh, record. You know, we're not in business to tow cars. We we, we would just as soon not have to tow any cars. Uh, but only towing 12 cars during an event like this is, I think, very significant and telling as to the effectiveness of the of the notification system. Snow removal operations uh, were conducted over a three night period as part of this blizzard event. Those began at 10 p.m. on uh, the 28th, Wednesday the 28th, and, and that on those operations we concentrated on the re complete removal of snow from the areas that we generally remove from, and that's Harvard Street in its entire length, from the village all the way to the town line, 
Uh, we do remove snow from the Coolidge Corner area, meaning Beacon Street from about Marion Street down towards Pleasant Street on both sides. Uh, we take snow away from Washington Square and Brookline Village, and that includes Washington Street from the village up through to Cypress Street. Uh, <clears throat> the snow was completely removed from those areas, uh, and that also uh, was very effective. School was canceled for two days on Tuesday and Wednesday. You know, we do try to put an emphasis to get schools back open as soon as we can. I think that we were pretty fortunate to be able to have them only canceled for two days, uh, and that's due to the, the hard work and the dedication of all of our employees uh, during the event. Just a quick note on the costs. This particular cost was still, of course, tabulating everything. Uh, but the estimated cost of this particular blizzard was about $532,000. Uh, and that uh, was through operations uh, uh, just a few days ago. <clears throat> just a real quick note on the second storm, uh, the mini blizzard that we're calling it. They were calling for eight, anywhere from 8 to 10 inches of snow. Uh, and this particular storm, when it was supposed to be heavy wet snow, well, we ended up getting 16 inches of not so heavy snow, a little bit wetter than the blizzard, but uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, 16 inches of snow. Also, that was recorded at the Municipal Service Center. That storm began at 10 p.m. on February 1st and concluded at midnight on uh, February 2nd. It was a 26-hour uh, duration. Uh, we did declare again a snow emergency, uh, and that took effect 6 a.m. Monday, and it was for a 24-hour period only. Uh, till 6 a.m. on Tuesday. In addition to that, we did delay the tr pickup of rubbish uh, one day, but kept the rest of this week uh, the schedule normally. So we actually picked up two days worth of rubbish today. Uh, and generally, that's what we do. This particular storm, I think because of the timing of it, uh, we, we towed a few more cars than we did even during the blizzard. We towed 30 cars during this storm. I will tell you that uh, that dispatch did put out a call for about 80 tows, but only 30 ended up being towed for various reasons. Uh, it's quite a bit more than what we had during the blizzard. School again was canceled on Monday and Tuesday, uh, and we are working feverishly right now to get schools ready to open for tomorrow morning. Uh, it's not just a matter of clearing the snow at schools, uh, and you know, on the walkways and the stairs and all that, that's very important but uh, we need to clear the sidewalks that lead up to the schools. And because we have on-street teacher parking around a lot of our schools, we need to clear the roadways uh, to allow for on-street teacher parking as well, which, which means actual removal of snow. So there's a lot of work that has to be done to get schools ready to go. And I have assured the superintendent that we will be ready to go for tomorrow morning, normal hours. We, uh, tonight we will be concentrating, again, like I say, on sidewalk routes in the school areas. Uh, but more importantly, we need to begin because of the amount of snow that we have on the ground. We basically budget for 43 inches of snow in a season in Brookline. That's what we budget for. Well, in the, this one week period, we've actually gotten 46 inches of snow in a one week period. So we've gotten a whole season's worth of snow in one week. Uh, and that's put a real strain on our resources. And also on the roads, uh, I, I know that you've noticed that uh, a lot of the secondary streets are very narrow, uh, and that's becoming an issue. We have posted some of them uh, with no parking. We have posted others one way only. Uh, but our intent uh, is to begin tomorrow uh, conducting a road widening operation. We we're actually going to send loaders and trucks and run the, what we call running the gutter. We're gonna actually run, remove the snow right, to, right from the gutter, from the curb line and, to, and haul it away so that we can at least restore the roadways back to their original width uh, to allow for not only you know, two-way traffic but for parking as well. So that's gonna begin tomorrow uh, during the day with our own forces and it's gonna continue uh, tomorrow night and probably for a few nights uh, with uh, uh, with contractor equipment as well. Can I, um, Just the estimated cost of this this storm, we haven't completed tabulation of this yet, but this storm so far, not including uh, anything from this point forward, is about two hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars. So, Commissioner, I think uh, Selectman Daly has a quick interjection here. Yes. Well. 
As, as you know, I have um, sought some money in this override for some snow removal equipment. And um, it's a very, I've, I've been met with a lot of skepticism. In fact, um, people told me I was pandering and various other uh, things. And I want to say um, that not, I mean, as you would have noticed in, in our information packets, we had a number of emails from people who were, were very interested in the sidewalk snow removal. But I spoke to Andy earlier today, and not only have his, and I want to thank you, Kevin, as well. Uh, your that. guys have done a tremendous amount of work, and um, we really do appreciate it. But there's just so much snow out there. And Andy and I were talking as he was, he was about to send them home to get a little sleep before they come back to do the work tomorrow. But what he was saying was the, the uh, very equipment that I've been talking about, um, that I would like some money for, um, would, would be equipment that they would actually use to do the street widening as well as to remove snow banks from the sidewalks. And, and Andy, I want you to speak a little bit because I know you said to me today that the way we do it now is extremely labor intensive. And if you had some better equipment, um, as I've requested for you, <laughs> that it would it, it be extremely helpful um, in, in uh, uh, getting to, to this, these problems. The way, we, the way we widen streets now is we use very large front end loaders and we actually run them down the gutter and we scoop up the snow. <coughs> we actually put it into big piles and then we scoop it up and dump it into trucks. Very labor intensive. And then along the way as we go by driveways we need to have smaller, the little skid steel loaders that you see, we have to have them available to clean up the driveways uh, as we go by because the last thing we want to do is make, make a mess on the driveway. So that's very labor intensive. You need a lot of trucks, you need a lot of loaders, and you need a lot of hand work to follow it. Uh, the piece of equipment that I suggested to Selectman Daly uh, uh, that we think about purchasing in the future, and r I really wish I had it today, uh, is a very large snow thrower. It's 102 inches wide and it uh, will remove a snow bank almost 60 inches high uh, and throw it directly into a truck. It allows you to have a rolling continuous operation of roadway widening without doing all the plowing and piling and, and reloading and, and hauling it away. The trucks would just follow this machine down the road and you'd blow the snow directly into the trucks uh, as you were rolling down the road. It's almost a continuous operation. Very efficient way of doing it. You probably get three or four times the the, uh, the, the production out of a system like that. Uh, we were so uh, excited about that piece of equipment, we actually called around to a lot of the dealers today to see if they had <laughs> one that they might want to demo to us. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, they did not. Um, we were looking forward to trying that piece of equipment out. but. That's an invaluable piece of equipment for widening roads and for doing lots of other things with snow removal as well. And of course, the the uh, the Bombardier sidewalk tractors are also invaluable for us. Yeah, and I I got contacted also today by from <coughs> Scott Englander, who's a member of the transportation board, and and uh, it, it was and I I don't mean uh, no criticism to you guys because I know this is just the sheer volume of snow and it it's hard to find places to put put it, but he was telling me that a number of people had, he knew I was interested in this issue, and a number of people had contacted him about, um, you know, sometimes the, when your plows go through, uh, the end of the sidewalk, you know, was getting a pile and people could walk on the sidewalk but then couldn't, couldn't get out to cross the road and, and that sort of thing, and, and he wanted to express his, um, his uh, very large support for the concept of getting you a little more equipment to yeah. um, take care of I think of we're all in agreement about getting that equipment and uh, Commissioner Papasturgeon while we're on the subject and because we're going to be talking about this later anyway I mean are we committed to getting that equipment whether or not there's a specific override uh, item for it we, we, in previous discussions we've talked about our seven hundred thousand dollar mandate for for new equipment in the DPW and you know, are we fast tracking this stuff so that we're getting it right right away, regardless of whether it's included in the in the override? It, it's a.
pretty sensitive subject. The 700,000, you know, we're all very appreciative to get every single year. And, and that 700,000 is used to replace, you know, routinely replace our rolling stock, you know, our trucks and things of that nature, trucks and loaders. It's generally not used for, for large uh, specialty pieces of equipment. Um, they're very expensive. Uh, yeah, we do try to lease as much as we can so that we're spreading the costs out over a three year period. Uh, could we buy the snow equipment? I'm sure that we could probably find a way to do it somehow. It, it would take a very large chunk of our budget to do that and would probably, uh, you know, be to the sacrifice of other things. Well, to, for, um, for, for, can you be more specific? What, what do we do to, to buy next year and could it be delayed a year so that we can get this, well, that's this the, equipment that's so That's the days? exercise that we would have to go through. To look at because because our capital replacement program is laid out for many years in advance right. so we would have to determine what's what would have to be delayed first assess the condition of that particular piece of equipment can it be delayed a year can it put, be put off uh, and how much capacity do we have within the budget to actually pick up some of these other costs so uh, it's, it's a very large piece of equipment but you have to understand it's a specialty piece of equipment we only use it you know for a very limited time of the year uh, so, I mean, it can only be used for snow, and that's it. Uh, right, but that's a question that I have. in our arsenal in the past. It's a right. you know, relatively, you know, updated kind of technology, and it seems to me that we've had a lot of years now of replacing our front end loaders and, 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 you know, making sure our rolling stock was, was, was doing great. I, it just seems like we could, we could fit this in since it's, since it's become available now, and it's clear that we need it. Well, can I, can I just add, though, that that 700000 was set in our first override uh, uh, quite a number of years ago? 1997. And, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, I'm, I'm sure the costs of your equipment go up as to all of our costs, uh, we as homeowners and whatever, uh, notice. I mean, I, I, you know, I, the best case scenario on this override has us cutting on the town side of the budget. So there's not going to be uh, extra pockets of money around. And I, I think that this is a, a very modest request that will have a, you know, a extremely beneficial effect. I, I just have a question, because I, I guess I've misunderstood the nature of the equipment. Um, it can only be used for snow. It couldn't be used for leaves, for example? No, not this, this particular piece of equipment. Huh. It's a self-contained snowblower uh, unit that mounts yeah. on the front of a front end loader in place of the bucket. And it's, it's, it's snow equipment and snow equipment only. Okay. So the part of it that throws it into the, um, the truck is similar to the things that are used for leaf removal and that are like huge vacuum cleaners, though, uh, right? They're, they're not very similar, no. Huh. No, leaf removal equipment is quite different than this. All right, but when I'm, do you know what I'm saying? Well, would you, let me ask you this. Would you use your, your snow thrower to uh, pick up leaves in your yard? No, but I use my grass cutter to do that. Yeah. I use my lawnmower to do it. You wouldn't use a snow thrower to do that. Yeah. So, so it's I mean, really it's limited to only snow. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I, I also want to point out that town meeting uh, voted very enthusiastically for uh, <coughs> Frank Caro's uh, warrant article. When was that? Last year, Last at year. some point. Yeah. Um, there, there, it's, it's not just me that's interested in well, snow uh, removal. I think you've heard all of us say we're interested yeah. in it. I yeah. just wonder whether it has to be part of the override or not. That's, I'm trying to minimize the, the amount of, yeah. the, of the override if possible. And if there's another way of getting this equipment, which I agree completely with you, is, is, is what we need right now, I'd like to find the other way rather than to, to increase the amount of the override for it. But let's save that discussion for later tonight. Okay. Can Sorry. I just ask Mr. Um, Kleckner, though, to comment while we're on the subject about, because I know we have increased our efforts at getting merchants to um, comply uh, help out uh, in the commercial areas, and I know that the enforcement efforts have been stepped up. Sure. Uh, well, the uh, the resolution that you referred to that was submitted, Mr. Carroll, uh, required a um, uh, a uh, 
task force that I conve I have convened, and we've been meeting throughout the fall and now the winter. And um, one of the things we've really focused on is not just enforcement, but also the town's responsibilities, because we are property owners as well, and we have actually quite a bit of sidewalk. And um, we need to do a better job. Uh, I think you've heard uh, about the effectiveness of this piece of equipment. So I think it's I think it's very important. I, I need the board's policy direction about you know how to fund it or whether to fund it, and then we'll go and identify what how, how we can do that. So, um, but in terms of the the need for this piece of equipment, I think it sounds great. I think it's what has allowed our DPW to be as effective as it has over the years without with, with reduced staffing. It's the technology, the uh, effectiveness of the equipment that has really helped. Um, we were talking about the blizzard of 78, and I'm sure the equipment has, you know, is 10 times better these days, and that's what has helped. So I'm fully supportive of the piece of equipment. I, I just need the board's direction in terms of uh, the financing. Can I have a, a, a quick uh, sort of follow-up about the situation on the sidewalks, which I know you're very familiar with, um, where uh, people have actually cleared the sidewalk and the various snow removal activities have piled up those six-foot banks on the curbside. And so my question really ha relating to equipment is <coughs> would the, um, the sidewalk equipment, not, not this thing we're talking about, the blower thing, but the regular plow um, sidewalk clearing plows, are they able to get through that where there's like four feet on one side and six feet on the other side and a very narrow track in between? It's a good question and I can only tell you what our experience has been. Last year, <coughs> last year you authorized us to buy a new sidewalk tractor with a snow thrower. Right. Uh, and thank God you did because uh, we relied very heavily on that piece of equipment along with a sister piece of equipment that we had purchased in 2008. Those two Bombardier tractors which are equipped with snow throwers and sanders uh, really carried us through the bulk of the sidewalk clearing on this particular storm. The older machines the <coughs> that we had, uh, that, oh, most of them, oh, well, quite a few of them were broken down uh, and the ones that were running were not able to get through uh, those massive amounts of snow. I will tell you that the Bombardiers went through them very nicely. Uh, they're very easy to mach machines to operate and they do a good job. They, get, they scrape it right down uh, to bare pavement. Uh, and then sand it as they go by. So, you know, we're glad that we have those two machines. I'd love to augment our fleet with a couple more of those and phase out the older machines. I think it makes a big difference in the, uh, the effectiveness of the sidewalk. Well, and, and I would even go so far as to say that opening school really depends on your ability to get the sidewalks Correct. open so that kids can walk to school. Yes. But the, um, our proposal is for an additional bombardier uh, initially, and also um, the, um, the snow thrower thing, which would help get rid of some of that, the banks the that then banks. go back right. over yeah. onto people's sidewalks. And um, the, uh, it, w it would, of course, if we, it's in the override, be an ongoing um, $65,000 a year. But uh, as Andy has said, these uh, um, need to, some of the other, pieces of older equipment need to be replaced and um, that I'm sure uh, you know I know I know from our discussions that he could certainly uh, use that okay so, so, um, so, so before I get into the second piece of this which is the of course the, uh, the the deficit discussion I, I would be very remiss if I didn't you know stand up and tell you how proud I am of the men and women of the Public Works Department for the job that they did this past eight days. They, they were phenomenal and they did it without complaining. They worked around the clock. They did everything we asked them to do uh, and I thought that it really came together this storm. So I, I've been so proud of our people and I think that you should be and the residents of this town ought to be as well and that is due uh, for the most part due to the efforts of the, my director of highway and sanitation who dedicates his every waking moment to fighting snowstorms and he's the best in the business. So 
I want a little dodge. Yes. Kevin Jones. Good job, Kevin. I, sh I should also note to you that when when we fight a storm, a snowstorm, the Public Works Department comes together as one team. All of our divisions participate uh, to get the job done, and that includes parks and open space, it includes water and sewer, it includes highway and sanitation, uh, and also to some extent our engineers. So we all pull together when it snows, we're one cohesive unit, and I think that we're a mean fighting machine when it comes <laughs> to fighting snow. Kevin, I hope you t vote that uh, Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say, um, having lived through the blizzard of 78 and several other snow storms since then, um, I am extremely impressed with the teamwork, but also the planning that goes into this. Um, I think one of the big differences between the blizzard of 78, which wasn't even as much snow as we've just had, um, is that I, I think that it was kind of like a shock that so much snow fell and people were caught unprepared. And what I've observed is that we are really, really on top of it. You have the best weather forecasts better than the TV weather or anybody else. And I know they're having debates now about whether we use the European system or the American system, how to predict. Um, but I know that you stay very, very closely on top of it. And, and, and also, it's a 24-hour uh, preparation and follow through and we truly appreciate it you just all you need to do is go into another community and see how truly truly uh, we are fortunate to have you and our DPW taking care of us so thank you, thank you. any statistics on um, citations and fines to property owners who aren't shoveling their own sidewalks uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me for the blizzard yet. Uh, that, of course, was uh, this past week. Uh, the snow enforcement period for the latest storm really didn't take effect until this morning. Uh, commercial properties, the deadline is, was at nine, uh, 10 a.m. this morning uh, for commercial and multi-family residential units. Uh, and the deadline for compliance for residential properties is 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, that brings us to the, the close of the 30-hour window. Uh, so tomorrow we'll be out there in force, uh, all the agencies that uh, have uh, enforcement authority, uh, and we'll be uh, issuing warnings and we'll be issuing citations for folks that don't comply. Uh, I, I have to assume that today they were at least given directives today to be out there this, uh, after 10 a.m. Uh, enforcing the commercial areas. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, compliance with the bylaws, so I don't have the numbers yet. You know, we'll we'll, we'll compile them at uh, at a later date. Thank you. I want to add that uh, that the fire department has requested that when people go out to to shovel their sidewalks, that they also be mindful of the fire hydrants. Yes. Uh, that may be in front of their property, and uh, I hope that nobody ever has to use the fire hydrant. But uh, if it comes to that, uh, the, I'm sure people will be happy that they took the 10 or 15 minutes to uh, shovel three feet around the hydrant. Okay, so let's move on to our uh, deficit budgeting, please. Uh, as I have come before you and many times in the past, uh, I'm presenting to you what our analysis is of the FY15 uh, snow and ice budget. Uh, up through the blizzard uh, of last week, uh, including uh, uh, the snow removal. Uh, our budget is now in deficit of about $613,000. Uh, this does not include any costs uh, that have been incurred on the most recent storm uh, and on any costs that were, are prob most probably going to be incurred from this point going forward, at least for the next two or three days. Uh, so we're in deficit mode now. Uh, before I can pay any bills, uh, I have to get authorization from the Board of Selectmen to allow us to uh, op to uh, deficit spend the snow and ice budget, which requires the Board to then invoke uh, Chapter 44 of Massachusetts General Law, Section 31D, uh, and this would be in lieu of a reserve fund transfer. The way we normally do business is, is, is the Board will invoke this chapter of state law. It will allow us to continue 
moving forward with uh, with the winter operations, uh, and then later on this spring, either in May or, or, or probably the beginning, beginning or middle of May, we will then reconcile the snow and ice budget against any potential surpluses we may have uh, in our own budget, uh, offset those, and then come before you and ask for a reserve fund transfer for the balance, or you may elect to. Um, and put the difference on the tax rate for FY16. So that, that would come before you at a later date. So I'm asking you today uh, to invoke Chapter 44, Section 31D. Thank you. Second, Franco. I know there was some conversation, maybe hopeful, about a, uh, a disaster being declared and the federal mm -hmm. government reimbursing us for some portion of our snow clearing operations. Is that uh, still a possibility uh, in your mind? Uh, we 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 figured that that was a distinct possibility from the get-go on both of these storms, at least especially on the blizzard uh, when they declared a, a travel ban. Uh, so we kind of figured there was going to be some sort of a um, potential reimbursement. Uh, so I directed all of our folks to be very diligent in how they did their record keeping for the blizzard, and they did that. Uh, I will tell you, though, that the process, the application process, and the analysis and the adjustment, all that takes quite a long time. So yes, there is a potential that we, we see some reimbursement of our costs for the blizzard. Uh, probably won't see it for some time. Uh, so we still need to go forward uh, with uh, our budget, uh, you know, normally until that happens. Once, if that does happen, that money then is, is uh, put into a, uh, a special account by the town administrator and, uh, you know, we'll deal with it at that point. Okay, anything further? All right, well, I uh, move that we invoke Massachusetts General Law Chapter 44, Section 31D to allow the Department of Public Works to expend funds in excess of the FY 2015 budget appropriation for snow and ice control. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgot about you, Neil. Selectman Wyshynski. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. It's, uh, it, you guys are going to need to speak up. Okay. Selectman, did you hear the did you hear the motion, Selectman Wyshynski? Uh, yes, I did through this screen. Okay. And I'm doing a little juggling act. And I'm sorry, I, I don't think we quite heard your vote. What did you vote? Uh, the vote was aye. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. We're on to uh, agenda item number eight. I'm sorry, six, uh, which is uh, three different personnel. Uh, authorizations for hiring and Commissioner Papasturgeon. Uh, thank you. And before you tonight, uh, uh, to get the authorization to hire four positions within the Public Works Department. The first is the Conservation Assistant position that's currently held by Heather Liss. I don't know if you know Heather. Heather is an incredibly valuable employee, and we're really sorry to see her go. But she's moving on and taking a position with the town of Burlington. Uh, and we wish her well. A uh, very important position for us, and we ask uh, your permission to uh, to uh, to uh, fill that that vacancy. I believe Friday is her last day, uh, and we've already taken the liberty of advertising for the position uh, in anticipation of your decision. And I will tell you that to date we've gotten uh, a lot of resume resumes, hundreds of them. So there's a very big interest out there to fill that position. Uh, the second position is for a park maintenance craftsperson in the Parks and Open Space Division. Uh, this position became available due to a promotion, an internal promotion. Uh, uh, it ultimately uh, stemmed from a termination, and as when we have somebody, uh, a vacancy in the upper grades, we generally promote from within uh, until we get to a position where, uh, where it's a... Uh, a uh, outside hire. So this particular position is uh, is also uh, an outside hire, uh, and we have two vacant pipe layer positions in the water and sewer division. Uh, these are both due to promotions and ultimately from uh, retirements that occur occurred within the water and sewer division. So uh, there are four positions that we would really like to get authorization to fill, and we uh, seek your permission. Any comments or questions from board members? I just want to remind you that we're seeking 
to increase the uh, diversity of our workforce in Brookline. And I hope every effort will be made to uh, seek the most uh, diverse candidate pool as possible. And if you need input on that, please consult with Mr. Bow and Lloyd Jellino, our new uh, director of, of, of diversity for the town. Uh, seeing no objections, I'm going to move that we authorize fill, filling the following vacancies within the Public Works Department, Conservation Assistant, Park Maintenance Craft Person, and Water Pipe Layer Laborer. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman De DeWitt? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Selectman Wyshynski? Selectman Wyshynski? Well, sorry, I had to, sorry about that. I had to send the mute off for uh, aye. <laughs> okay. Selectman Franco? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now have a, uh, another personnel matter, and this is uh, the question of authorizing the filling of the vacancy in the Selectman's office. Uh, Deputy Town Administrator, Assistant Town Administrator, Sean Cronin. I know Mr. Kleckman wants to say a few words about this one. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, before I move on to uh, seeking your request to fill the position, I did want to have an opportunity, and I'm sure the board would like to as well, to acknowledge um, Sean Cronin's uh, resignation, upcoming resignation, uh, effective on February 19th. And I'm very proud to announce uh, that Sean has been appointed to a senior position in the administration of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He will be a senior deputy commissioner of the Department of Revenue. And I think it's important to note that uh, this position is a key position because the governor just announced a, uh, an executive order which creates a so-called municipal compact, uh, which is looking at a more effective way to uh, partner between the state government and the uh, cities and towns. And Sean will play a key role in that. So Sean has been with the town for um, over 17 years as, uh, um, and was uh, started in the assistant town administrator role and became uh, promoted to the uh, position of deputy uh, town administrator. For us, that means uh, he's the uh, chief budget officer of the community. And I think for those of you, especially this board, the advisory committee and others who, who are integral to the budget process know how effective and um, strong of a budget manager that Sean is. Uh, I used to do this job myself, and I can tell you that Sean uh, is the best I've seen uh, doing this. So it's going to be a great loss, but we're at the same time very proud of, uh, of Sean's uh, service to the town. And uh, moving on to uh, bigger and better things, I guess, uh, with, this, with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So at that point, I'll just stop if the board wants to comment, and then uh, after that, I'd like to talk about the replacement of the position. I know everybody wants to come. Sure. Like <laughs> daily. Well, I, the, uh, the ability to strike fear into the heart of all the department heads <laughs> is like a key element of this job <laughs> that Sean's very good at. But no, seriously, um, you have done a tremendous job, Sean, and I've really appreciated your dedication to detail and your comprehensive knowledge of uh, our budget and the uh, the school budget and, and everything else. So uh, we are going to miss you, but um, it's the, the sort of a bump upstairs on the state level is, is well deserved, and um, good luck. So I can do it. Well, I have to say, um, um, Sean has been invaluable. He is the go-to guy for any question having to do with finance or um, obscure things that nobody else would think about, Sean will always find an answer. I had a, a particular experience working with him when he was sort of the interim town um, uh, administrator um, before uh, we hired Mr. Kleckner, and I will say that he would have been a fine town administrator had he wished to be so at that point. Not that I'm disappointed in Mr. Kleckner because I think Mr. Kleckner is great. Um, but uh, I do believe that his elevation and recognition by the governor is well deserved. And frankly, um, it seems to me that we are doubly fortunate because at least now we'll know somebody in state government who's going to take our calls, I hope. <laughs> Um, so we b wish him the very best of luck. It's going to be tough to fill his slot. I won't even say shoes. 
Um, but I know that he's been training people, so I am optimistic that we will survive this. Good. Selectman so Wyshynski, anything to add? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I actually lost you for a little bit, but I'm glad uh, uh, I got you back. Uh, I've worked with uh, Sean for, oh, I guess 15 of his 17 years. Uh, the first part of my time was with the advisory committee and most recently with the Board of Selectmen. I was privileged to be at the MMA uh, conference last week where Sean's uh, uh, appointment was announced. And I saw uh, not only that he's respected within, within town here, but I, I could see uh, throughout the state uh, his colleagues hold him with the highest uh, uh, of respect. And, and it was very gratifying to see. So I just wish uh, Sean the best in his new job. And uh, we're going to miss him. Franco. Uh, I'll, I'll echo uh, my colleagues' comments. Uh, I started my career in, in Brookline on the, uh, the advisory committee and uh, can speak firsthand for the financial prowess of, uh, of our, uh, our current Deputy Town Administrator, Mr. Cronin. Um, and, uh, and as uh, Slotman Wyshynski said, uh, as a former state employee, I can say that uh, Mr. Cronin is well known in the State House uh, and soon to be better known uh, in his new role uh, with the Baker administration. Uh, I, I think many people who may not be as uh, close followers of town government as members of this board and town meeting members and members of the advisory committee uh, may not appreciate the amount of knowledge that Mr. Cronin is the keeper of, uh, particularly in regards to the, the fiscal policies, which um, are confusing for even those of us who, who uh, review we them constantly. Know. Yes, <laughs> um, but, uh, but he is always quick to point out what the policies are and uh, sure that we follow them. Uh, so he's going to be uh, sorely missed, and hopefully he will remember us here in Brookline in his new role, um, and uh, we can expect uh, the dump trucks full of cash to be rolling into town hall. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Uh, Sean, I'll just echo what my colleague said, and uh, you have an utter, utter mastery of the, the subject matter of municipal finance, and particularly Brookline's municipal finance. I'd, Richard, so one of Richard Kelleher's uh, legacies to us was, was, was finding you and hiring you. Uh, you, you're in, in large part are responsible for, for the, the, the financial health of this town that we all enjoy. Um, and uh, I want to add to you, your credentials, and you know, not only are you a master of, of, of this uh, pretty arcane subject matter, but you're an educator too. I don't think there's a single selectman or, uh, or member of the advisory com committee or uh, and there's many town meeting members and many other citizens who have uh, s sat down with you and had you explain the nuts and bolts and you've, you've responsible for teaching a lot of people about what, what it is that you do too. So congratulations. We, we know there'll be great things coming from you in the future and uh, we know we haven't seen the last of you in the town of Brookline too. Thank you for all your service. Well, can we have a round of applause for Sean? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I, think, I, think, I think he's a little weepy here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, 17 years is a long time. Uh, it's been unbelievable here. I joke with, you know, people who know me really well that, you know, I came here single and a lot of hair and in better shape than I am now. Now I get three <laughs> kids and a wife and, you know, put on a few pounds. And, no, it's been a long, you know, it's been, a, it's been fantastic. I just want to say two real, really two things. One, it's not one person who has, um, you know, it's not me, it's not the role of the deputy. It's, it's a team effort in uh, the financial management of this town, finance director, town administrator, advisory committee. You know, I can't believe the amount of time residents put in um, for no pay and what, what this board does for virtually no pay. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not any one person. Um, I remember when Brian Sullivan left, everybody said, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Brian's leaving. And the town was fine and, you know, I, and I'm very confident that the town will continue to be a model for financial excellence, will maintain its AAA bond rating. And, uh, you know, I know in my new role in a couple of weeks, we'll always point to Brookline as, as the, as the uh, model for how to, how to manage things. And then just in terms of the role, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, 
as, as Neil said, you know, he was there when the, when the position was announced. So it's, a, it's the Division of Local Services, which is within uh, DOR. So they um, updated or took a position and elevated it. So the title is Senior Deputy Commissioner for Local Affairs. Um, and I'll be working. So there's a lot of day-to-day -day stuff, oversight of municipal finance across the state, you know, certification, tax rates, free cash, all that stuff. But the stuff that I'm truly interested in is the um, statewide policy initiatives that I hope the administration will uh, be considering. Uh, so working closely with the Secretary of ANF and her staff, um, things like OPEB reform. Um, I'll be her designee on the MSBA, uh, which will be interesting. I'll see it from the other side. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, so some of the statewide issues um, that I hope that they will look at, you know, property tax exemptions, modif you know, updating those, um, which are pretty arcane and outdated. You know, um, some public works issues. Uh, you know, the, the, the cabinet that Mel talked about is hopefully going to uh, take a, a look across all state agencies, all secretariats, and take a teamwork approach to dealing with um, all the issues that cities and towns face, whether it be improving recycling or wastewater management, you know, nuts and bolts finance, um, you know, better leveraging state procurement state IT resources, those types of things to help cities and towns, and obviously uh, work to promote best practices through uh, local services. So, uh, so I am, believe me, I, I hope I don't actually come here on February 23rd and I know to turn. I uh, will <laughs> actually keep straight um, coming down 93. Um, but I mean, I will miss this place immensely. Uh, it was, it's a fantastic place. The uh, public's so supportive. Might not always agree, which uh, it's a democracy. Um, but. Um, you know, from where I live, I see the direct opposite, and you see the results and the services and the, and the look of the town, and you compare that to a community that gets its stuff together and does it right, and uh, it's like night and day. And again, it's a total team effort, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a fabulous place. So, you definitely haven't heard the last time. I hope to. I won't be coming up with boatloads of money. I've already been told that. <laughs> <laughs> To stone a mortar here or anywhere. We else. know you're a fiscal conservative. I am. <laughs> I am a fiscal conservative. So now I'm getting weepy. But uh, so yes. no, I. Um, it's been great, and uh, you know, I, you haven't heard the last of me, so I can promise you that. Good. Thanks so, again. But Shane. thank you for your kind words very much. Thanks for everything. One more. Let's say one more. And I, I would uh, I would thank you for, for all those comments, and I would note that uh, we are going to have a public uh, re reception oh, right. uh, for Sean on Wednesday afternoon at 4 p.m. Uh, February 18th, uh, where the public uh, can come to Town Hall and uh, uh, wish Sean well. Um, so that's going to be, I believe, from um, 4 o'clock to 6? 4 to 6, 4 to six I believe, uh, here in this building. And uh, we're post. You, you see the postings around, and uh, but it's Wednesday, February 18. So at this point, um, having heard all of all the all the things the deputy town administrator does, and that Mr. Cronin himself has uh, has created this position, um, it is essential that I fill this position, especially at this time when the town is uh, in the midst of, of uh, not only a budget process, but one that um, we're we're seeking uh, an override. Uh, to the voters, which uh, will really uh, require us to really keep track of things over over a number of years, because really we're looking at this uh, budget and this override uh, decision as a multi-year approach. So, um, in the way that uh, this uh, my, the selectman's office and my office is organized, we have the deputy town administrator, and then we have an assistant town administrator, and uh, the three of us form uh, of the professional management team. Really, there is no other. Uh, general administrative personnel in the town. Um, we have managers and finance and other areas, but they're very specific. This is the only area that's focused totally on the budget and management issues of the town. And so, um, obviously, I'd like to fill this position immediately. And I have someone who I um, am convinced will um, can fill Sean's shoes. Not not everybody starts off right away. Sean will admit, and as I have admitted when I first started my career, that um, you know we have to grow into into the position. No, Sean no, did no, no, it. Slegman no. Wyshynski, you still there? Slegman Wyshynski, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Again, thank you. 
sorry. So that's okay. So um, could you pl please stop playing yeah. your organ? <laughs> So uh, I would very much uh, intend to uh, promote Melissa Goff, who is the assistant town administrator and has been with the town for over eight years and has worked under Sean's uh, tutelage that entire period of time. Melissa is a uh, professional administrator. with uh, She possesses a master's degree in public administration. Uh, before her uh, eight years uh, coming to the town uh, back in 2006, um, she was with the city of Boston in a management uh, role. So. Uh, I'm very pleased that uh, we had a succession plan. I wasn't expecting Sean to leave so soon, but the fact that he is leaving, we did have a plan to promote Melissa, and that is my intent, uh, if you so uh, authorize me to fill that position. Um, if you do so, uh, I would immediately want to uh, advertise uh, for the assistant town administrator position. Uh, I believe, as uh, Sean has mentioned, uh, the town of Brookline is one community that a lot of people look towards um, as uh, a best practices in, in, uh, in management. And I know we were able to um, recruit and uh, uh, attract a very robust uh, candidate pool for this, for this position, and that's what I intend to do. So technically, uh, I'm looking for you to authorize me to fill the deputy town administrator role, uh, and I intend to uh, uh, promote Melissa Goff to that position, and then in turn, and to fill the assistant town administrator position, which will be done through a competitive uh, uh, process. So uh, as I see it then, we, we have two separate matters here. One is the uh, appointment of Melissa Goff to our new deputy town administrator, uh, as the new deputy town administrator, and then the authorized the filling of the assistant town administrator position. Is well, I, I, I take the position that I have the authority to hire the deputy town administrator, so I need you to <laughs> authorize me to fill the position. And I'm telling you, if you do that, I am going to promote oh, Melissa Goff. <laughs> and then in that case, then I would uh, uh, then um, ask you to uh, fill the assistant town administrator position. Got it. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Uh, I, I, I'm going to say that I concur that uh, appointing Melissa to, to the deputy administrator position is, is uh, uh, a fortunate circumstance that we have yes. Melissa ready, uh, trained for so long and so capable of doing the job herself from, from everything I know about her. So, Selectman yeah. Daly? Yeah, no, I want to say uh, I think Melissa is very competent and I'm uh, pleased to welcome her to this position. I do think you need to spend some time looking into the mirror with a kind of steely-eyed uh, hatchet face and saying no. But, uh, <laughs> This, this is no to get hard. that to get that right, maybe Sean can kind of do a little video for you before it goes. <laughs> Selectman Dewitt. Yes, um, I, I I totally concur with um, uh, Selectman Daly's comments and also Mr. Kleckner's comments because my feeling is that we are in a situation where um, having a transition with a new person would be very difficult and the good news here is that not only do we have somebody but she's also been well trained by uh, Sean and therefore we can blame him <laughs> if there's any problem which I do not anticipate um, but the good news here is that she has had many years of opportunity to participate in our management team to work closely with Sean and to be his understudy and frankly I can't think of a better way to have the new deputy town administrator's position filled and therefore would certainly support um, Mr. Kleckner's request. Okay, Selectman Wyshynski, anything? Uh, yes, uh, I'll just note that uh, we're, we're coming into a, a crucial time with respect to the uh, budget. The, uh, the budget plan is going to be released in the next uh, few weeks, and then we'll go through the entire um, vetting process with the Board of Selectmen and the advisory committee leading up to town meeting. And uh, having a vacancy in that position, I think, during this crucial time, would be uh, very difficult. So I'm glad we have someone as qualified and as uh, schooled and briefed uh, uh, and experienced uh, with our process, and I uh, fully support uh, uh, the town administrator on, on this action. 
Mr. Franco. I'll echo my colleague's comments. Uh, I think this is uh, this is great. Um, Melissa certainly uh, is experienced with the way we do things in Brookline, um, knows the budget um, and the fiscal policies and the department heads in the system we have here. And I think um, it's particularly fortuitous at this time when um, there's some state uh, budget crunches and, uh, and we're looking at an override um, that we have a, a steady and experienced hand uh, ready to step into this role. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move that we authorize the filling of the following vacancies in the Selectman's Office. Uh, first in the Office of Deputy Town Administrator and second in the Office of Assistant Town Administrator. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. The chair votes aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, Thank you. Melissa. <laughs> Please. Yes. I just want to um, first take the opportunity to, to thank Mel for his confidence in me and the board as well for their support. Um, I think the fact that I've been working with Sean for so long kind of gives me a, a unique perspective. Um, and I've appreciated all that he's built, the way that he interacts with town, the town government, um, the advisory committee, all the committees that we've staffed together. Um, I understand, you know, the shoes that are that are leaving are big, but um, it's not dissimilar to the transition that I saw in Boston when Lisa Signore left as CFO and Karen uh, Connor became the budget director. Karen's style and Lisa's style were very different as well. Um, it's the team atmosphere that brought me here to Brookline and I'm really excited to continue working with all the department heads and um, boards and commissions and committees. And um, I don't think that I'm ready to really talk about what it means to lose Sean. Um, <laughs> But I think that right now I'm focused on uh, my accelerated Cronin College program. Um, <laughs> but when we have the goodbyes, that's when I'll kind of impart, you know, you know, my my feelings about him leaving. Um, but I'm just really excited and looking forward to um, working with everyone. Thanks, Melissa. Great, thank you. All right, we're moving on to calendar item number eight. This is the question of approving in a reserve fund transfer for um, in trans or approving and transmitting to the advisory committee a reserve fund transfer. Uh, and this is for outside labor and employment legal services uh, related to the uh, personnel department. The Human Resources Department, Ms. DeBeau. Yes, um, Sandra DeBeau, HR Director. And I just want to reassure you, Nancy, that um, Melissa has her own style <laughs> of sort of persuading people to get <laughs> things done. And it, it is I am fist in a velvet glove. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yes. Um, I come before you um, because we have exhausted our... Um, legal um, line item for the year and we have um, a lot more coming down the pike. Um, I asked uh, Deutsch Williams who is our outside counsel to sort of give me an estimate of what we had pending and what they thought uh, would be um, the cost to the end of the fiscal year. Their estimate ranged from 121 to $225,000. Um, I took a very hard look at the estimate they had given me and did my own educated guess as to what was likely to settle and what was not likely to settle. And I think that um, a request of $165,000 will get us to the end of the year. I also um, have done a pretty thorough analysis of where we're spending the money um, with these um, costs because I am concerned that we have come forward in the last couple of years with a couple of reserve fund transfer requests. And um, there are, in particular, of course I can't go into great detail, but there are three uh, personnel matters that had to go to outside counsel um, and they have been uh, heavily litigated in multiple forums. Um, we've tried diligently to settle these matters and we're not close to settling. The, the demands um, to settle are uh, unreasonably high, we believe. And so unfortunately, in two of those cases, we're now in the discovery stage, um, which is very expensive with depositions um, and moving forward. I continue to be hopeful that we will be able to resolve these um, 
two of the matters at least. Uh, and, and there's a third matter that is uh, equally complicated um, with an employee um, who, uh, it, you know, we're, we're trying, again, many approaches to try to settle the matter and, and it, it's not being settled. So um, that is the primary reason that uh, we are so far over our budget. The other thing, um, it is AFSCME, uh, which is one of our larger um, unions with our clerical and labor, I mean, uh, labor force. They, they have taken on a strategy of filing unfair labor practices alongside with the grievances. They are not successful um, in this strategy in that they're not winning these unfair labor practices, but it puts us in immediate defensive mode where we have to expend money um, to reply to these charges against us and unfair labor practices saying that we actually violated the labor law and then there's the whole question of whether we violated the contract. And, and, and so it's really unfortunate. We've been spending a lot of time um, during the last six months uh, reaching out to the union, trying to establish uh, better relationships with them and uh, get away from this adversarial uh, posture that we seem to have on an ongoing basis. So um, that's kind of where we are now. We're trying to be as proactive as we can, um, but we have these two really big cases that are just killing us, to be frank. Questions for Mr. Bo? Slagman Daly. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm starting to wonder if um, we wouldn't be better off having an additional um, person in town council's office? Uh, I can answer that. I, it's something we're actively reviewing. Okay. Yeah, right, but then I'm guessing you still need to pursue these matters regardless yeah, I'm of... I'm looking yeah. at this for, right. for the next year's budget. For the next huh? budget. Yep. I mean, it, it's a, that's why I'm doing this analysis to see where we're spending the money. And, and that's why I'm pointing out that these the, the majority of uh, the overage, if you will, is these two that had to go out. They're, we couldn't have done them in-house. Most of the cases um, that are big, uh, we try to have them done in-house. But if you have a couple of them going on at the same time, it does take a lot of uh, resources. I mean, we use about five attorneys at Deutsch Williams to work on our various issues. But I think that if we look at the way, where we're spending the money, that there's definitely room to bring some of it in. Anything further? All right, I don't, I don't see where we have much of a choice, uh, yeah. as painful as it is to go into reserves for, for amounts this large and for uh, litigation expense, which is in some ways, uh, you know, not, you don't see anything. We don't get anything tangible for the, for this expenditure. Right. We don't get right. snow blowers or sidewalks <laughs> cleared or uh, teachers. But um, on the other hand, I think they, I think we, 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 this is a pain we have to endure. So uh, I will move that we approve and transmit to the advisory committee the request of the Human Resource Director, Sandra DeBeau, for a reserve fund transfer in the amount of $165,000 for outside labor and employment legal services. All in favor, say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Uh, aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. Next calendar item number nine, and this is the uh, annual 2015 Boston Marathon Special Permit Request from the Boston Athletic Association. Josh Nemzer is here to uh, request the permit and to talk to us a little bit about uh, this year's plans for the marathon. Josh? Good evening, everybody. Is it really that time again? It is that time again. Happy to be here to talk to you about the 119th running of the Boston Marathon, scheduled for Monday, the 20th of April. 2015. Really happy to be here after last year's marathon, after our experience in uh, 2013 to go through a successful uh, year as we had last year. Just gives us great joy to move up on to 2015. 
We made a lot of changes in last year's marathon, a lot security-wise, a lot to our operational program just to be able to continue to try to get better. And we're looking forward to taking some of those changes we made in 2014 into 2015. This year's race is going to be a field size of 30,000, down from the 36,000 that we had in 2014 in just recognition of the unique year that it was. Up from 3,000, up from 3,000 from the 27,000 that we traditionally had been. 30,000 appears to be a number that we'll settle into for the foreseeable future. We're looking to divvy that 30,000 up into four waves of runners. We used four waves last year for the very first time. This year, instead of 9,000 in each wave, we would do about 7,500 in each of them. We'd have a time frame where we would start the men's race at 10 a.m. We'd start the second wave at 10.25, third wave at 10.50, fourth wave at uh, 11.15, with our last starter going across the line in Hopkinton at about 11.30. Uh, last year, we took an extra 30 minutes and we gave it to the runners, just again, given the extraordinary circumstances. This year, we're going to go back to our six-hour official time limit, so reducing the amount of time that we would require the roads to be available to us in Brookline. The road closure in Brookline is scheduled for the uh, traditional 9.15. This year we would push back the road reopening till 5.30 or make it earlier rather till 5.30. It was 6 o'clock last year again just in recognition. We've been working with uh, Chief O'Leary and Captain Grotman in particular on the plans for this marathon. We've had a couple of sessions with him individually. He's been participating in the overall planning sessions that are held at the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency out in uh, Framingham. Um, great cooperation, as always, from all the service departments in Brookline. Typical infrastructure, the things that we put on your roads. Medical stations, four of them. Water stations, three of them. Clocks at each mile mark. Mile markers to indicate where people are going to be. Um, we're hoping to be able to get that road reopened after the last runners come by in as quick a manner as possible. Right before I came here, I was on a road reopening call with our team just to be able to make sure that we can get the, uh, the, uh, the roads back to, to Brookline. One of the big changes we made last year, again, in, on behalf of the public safety program was to provide additional barricades in Brookline along Beacon Street to be able to just protect the runners, be able to give a little bit more road clearance. Uh, it was asked for us to do that again, and we plan on doing that again. Um, so all in all, we're looking forward to a, a good marathon in 2015 without any real significant changes to the program, ratcheting back a little bit to reflect that we're going to a little bit more of a normal mode. The uh, last comment I'll make is that the guard is not down. There's still a great concern for safety, and that's still going to be the predominant efforts that we're going to put forth to be able to make the race as safe as possible. Good. Be happy to entertain any specific questions. Selectman Daly. Yes. Okay. Uh, I had I had some problems with the barricades, mm -hmm. and uh, I appreciate that you need security. Yep. But I thought the I you know I think the marathon has always been a very fun event that Brookline people have enjoyed uh, coming to see. Um, last year, I think it was kind of a nightmare. Um, it. People I saw you know people with little babies in their strollers, and they couldn't cross Beacon Street to take the baby home and um, there there was you know people were stuck for just hours and there was no time that anybody was letting them cross even at there were s several designated crossing spots along Beacon Street but the public safety people had just closed them off and um, I, I I kind of had, had a problem with sure. it honestly and I'm you know if that's the way it's going to be I'm going to ask you to explore uh, Commonwealth Avenue next year. <laughs> so took note of those comments that were provided to us after last year's marathon and in mm -hmm. consultation and discussions with the police department, that plan is being modified to reflect the fact that road crossings need to be available. And Captain Groveman is thinking specifically about how he's going to do that. I think we all recognize that at the height of the race, regardless of whether there are barricades or not, there's not going to be a real good opportunity to be able to cross the roads. So I think the issue is when the density is down, can you be able to get people across? And Clearly, Captain Grotman has heard the comments that were provided by the residents, by the board itself, and is looking to be able to modify that at some of the major intersections along the time. The finals of that barricade plan haven't been put together while he's still deliberating on that, but clearly that is his intent to be able to provide for uh, opportuni opportunities for crossing when, uh, when appropriate, again, with crowd density. 
Yeah, I'm just wondering, since you're going up 3,000 from the, you're going into kind of intermediate between what, what, what had been the standard number of runners to, to the group last year. So it is going to be more crowded than it has been historically. In terms of the runner participation right. number. M making it more difficult to cross. Um, uh, yeah, I w wouldn't be able to argue against the fact that we're adding 3,000 more, but I think in terms of that density being absorbed within the overall field, I think it would be probably negligible. It's going to be offset by the fact that in 20... 15, we are increasing the amount of time that we're giving the runners to leave Hopkinton, so the density of the crowd will be dispersed. So back in 2013, if I can recall correctly, we probably put that whole field of 27,000 out in under an hour, and now we're taking it into an hour and a half. So you'll see a thinner level of runners going along, which should facilitate just the issue that you're talking about, being able to get people across the roads. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll point out, most of those decisions are local, public safety oriented. So uh, many of the discussions about the barricades and about the crossing plan, we follow the direction of Captain Grotman and what it is that he's trying to do to be able to reflect the needs of the citizens. Josh, do any of the other communities upstream from us have a different approach to these crossings that, that we're, we haven't benefited from yet? The marathon, as you can appreciate, is almost eight different races within one, given the eight different communities and the locations that they are along the course. Ashland says they've got the best job in town. They're the first uh, mile two to mile five. It's done before they know it. Their issues really aren't uh, large at all. Their population is much thinner than we are. Um, as you get closer into the finish area, you come into more of an urban area, you come into um, roads that are just like Beacon Street from Cleveland Circle all the way into Audubon Circle. So to answer your question, yes, each community has their own different style of managing their course. But I would say that each, com each community has increased the number of devices that they've used to be able to manage the course for themselves. In some of the western communities in Ashland and in Framingham, they pick a couple of hot spots. There's just not a lot of them. As you've come a little bit further east from Framingham into Natick into Wellesley, last year we saw that there was just an incremental increase in the kinds of, kinds of devices that they asked for. To your west in Newton, they basically barricaded or coned the entire eight miles of course that they have from, no, not eight miles, about uh, six miles from 16 to about uh, 22. So most communities are increasing what it is that's out, that's out there. Um, in terms of the full barricades, that section of the road from Cleveland Circle into Boston itself has the, the most devices. Is there any practicality to having a temporary pedestrian bridge erected from you know, scaffolding materials, uh, you know, at, at a key intersection such as Coolidge Corner or Washington Square. We talked about that. What we ran into some issues with some of the um, handicap requirements, the accessibility and the length of the ramp that would be needed to be able to accommodate them. And when public safety was reviewing that, they just thought that it would be fairly challenging to be able to find the places to be able to put those ramps in there. So it was considered, I think I made a mention of that when I was here before you to talk about the half marathon. It didn't, it didn't prove to be feasible. Okay. And no other communities upstream from us have that? Nobody. I mean, Nobody. I think there's something at the finish line that's approx approximately. What you might really recall important. seeing in pictures is the photo bridge at the finish line itself, which is basically a structure across the road, but in terms of pedestrian, pedestrian overpasses, and yeah, we've, um, Arlington Street at the end of Boylston is a problematic road for the city of Boston, and we discussed it with them, and for many of the same reasons that it was uh, not uh, thought to be practical here in Brookline, it, was, uh, it wasn't considered practical in Boston. So no, no other community does have temporary crossings. Second, Frank. I'm hopeful that uh, the Captain Grotman, uh, along with the BAA, can come up to, with a solution to this crossing issue. I, I will note, though, that the, the barricades do serve a practical purpose in that they keep the road wide. Uh, in, in the past, uh, I know people get excited and tend to get off the curb and into the roadway, and that constrains the, the ability of the runner to, to get down the roadway. So having these barricades, as intrusive as they sometimes are, do allow for the runners to go down the course unimpeded and, and therefore uh, speed up the race, perhaps. Well, I, I could live with the barricades if we have publicized 
crossings and people actually at some point get to cross at those crossings. Which, and I think what you would see is um, towards the tail end of the race, when those, those are when the opportunities would present itself, when the density is such that it's really shoulder to shoulder across the road, it would be challenging for any public safety official to be able to let them go to. But clearly, again, as I've mentioned, it's been a topic of discussion and I know that there's a lot of thought being given to that by Captain Grogan and his staff to be able to make sure that when appropriate and when it's safe to be able to do so, to be able to let crossings occur at intersections like Dean Road at Washington Square at Harvard Street to be able to make a cross. There's no reason when the road's well, available to do it. For yeah, one of my concerns is, I mean, I think after last year that anybody who's taken the T is going to want to stay on the T side. And that means people kind of bunching up right along those tracks. I, I have some, some concerns about that. Always concerns when the green line is running. Um, one of the traditions of the marathon is that the, the green line runs. Um, I know that they try to be as cautious as they can when they're watching pedestrians along that northern side. But it, it didn't street. matter before because you'd wait for a break and you'd dart over and get on the tee. Last year, people couldn't get to the tee if they, if they had crossed over to the wider sidewalk. So that, that was uh, one, of the, one of the issues, I think, was people just couldn't, couldn't leave right. once they got there. No exception taken to any of your comments. I think last year was extraordinary with the number of runners that were there and the amount of spectators. I think everybody would agree, and I wouldn't even want to quantify just how many spectators were here in Brookline, but the crowds were as voluminous as ever creating that day. We had more than the Patriots are going to have for their parade tomorrow. That number might come down a little bit. <laughs> Anything further from members of the board? I'll, I'll just say I'm excited. The, uh, the field of elites this year seems to be uh, particularly noteworthy. So good job getting uh, the, the top flight runners in the, in the world to come. We'll give thanks to John Hancock, our title sponsor, that plays a large role in getting the elite field. And it should be a wonderful field. A lot of strong Americans there. We should note that one of our former colleagues, Jesse Mermel, yeah. is planning That's on running right. this year yeah. on behalf of the uh, the charitable um, group of Team Brookline, and I believe her her she's running on behalf of the library. Correct. Yeah. Stephen Wyshynski with us still? He's out training. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, are you there? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. We're just checking on you. <laughs> He's taking some yeah, taking some old maps in between. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, if there's nothing further, I'm going to move that we um, uh, approve the request for a special use permit for the running of the 2015 Boston Marathon on April 20th, 2015, uh, in accordance with the, uh, what do we call this? Special use permit. The, spe the specific special use permit that's uh, uh, numbered 7-1 in our packet. I'm not going to repeat all the, uh, all the conditions in that. Uh, and if there's nothing further, I will put it to a vote. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman DeWitt? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank Good you luck. very much. This is assuming the snow's gone by then. Assuming the snow's I was going to say, right, let's get the snow melting. Oh, On a personal note, I would just like to say that I am retiring after this year's Boston Marathon. Oh, wow. After nearly 20 years of being involved with the marathon and working very closely with all of the members of the Brookline community, and it's been a great joy starting the half marathon back in 2001 with your great support. It's been a real honor to work with all of the staff members of your service departments, with the board and everything like that. Not sure who will be coming on board. We didn't have a great succession planning like Mr. <laughs> Cronin had, had in mind there, but uh, I know Mr. Grilk, our executive director, is thinking ahead on that. But I did want to just say thank you to everybody. Thank you. Congratulations, Josh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for being thank on you. top yes, of all these for, things. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you for great. many thank years. Thank you kindly. Have a good evening. Good evening. Uh, next, we have a uh, board and commission interview. Dana, Dana Teague for, is a candidate for Human Resources Board. Dana, are you here? Hello, good evening. Good evening, Dana. Uh, welcome. Thanks for your interest in this. Tell us why you're uh, interested in serving and your qualifications, please. Um, I've lived in Brookline for 30 years. 
um, our daughter went through all the Brookline school systems and now that she's out of college I'd like to volunteer and offer some of my experience um, as a volunteer. Um, I have an HR background. I've been certified in mediation, um, worked extensively in HR in succession planning. Um, I've worked closely with the Diversity Council. And in my current position, I am um, interact daily with our union workforce. So I'm involved in mediation on an informal level, all the way up to arbitrations. Were you here a few minutes ago when we spoke about our uh, need for a reserve fund transfer to uh, <laughs> cover uh, litigation expenses? Yes, I did hear that. Any, uh, any experience with that kind of problem and with uh, our ideas about what we might be missing? Um, I'd be interested to talk about that more. Yep. Um, so I'm very interested in the diversity, um, especially sustainable diversity and inclusion. Um, one of the stories I always tell, when my daughter was in first grade at Lincoln School, there were six languages spoken, so I believe it's an ethnic and language inclusion process. Um, I think as the town grows and there's more and more changes, I think that's going to be really interesting to follow. Um, I've done a lot of work in the company. Um, I work at NSTAR, which was officially renamed on Monday. We're now Eversource. Oh, really? Um, yeah, six companies right. um, came together and are now one. Um, I've yeah. got to say, when I, uh, you're, the names seem to get steadily further and further away from electric, you know. So <laughs> I, I have trouble now, with, you know, thinking, okay, what, to, which company is that? Is that my? Yeah. It was a lot easier when it was Boston Edison. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When it sounded like what it is. Um, over the years, I've worked um, quite a bit in succession planning. Um, we had an effort underway a few years ago on something called knowledge management as our workforce is aging and a lot of knowledge was going out the door. We were trying to find different ways to capture that so that we could train new people. Um, one of um, the things that I work on quite a bit on a daily basis is performance management. And there are really strong ways now to use analytics to improve the effectiveness of the workforce but also the productivity. And it's been my observation that the things that we measure are the things that we do well. So it's really just highlighting those items that you really want to do well and exceed in your best practices. Um, in a number of organizations, I've worked on policy, policy development and procedures. I worked at Bank Boston doing that, and also I took a lead in doing that at Boston Edison. Um, the bottom line is I work day to day with the union. Um, and I think mediation comes into that, and I really would like to participate and be able to help. Very good. Questions for Ms. Teague? Uh, I'm interested in um, your sort of uh, overall thoughts about how we go about recruiting. Um, and I know municipal government is not quite the same as private utility, but just thoughts about outreach, recruitment, Anything at all? Um, let me think about that one. I think having a panel of people interviewing, once you get the people in the door, just just to have the same measurement of, of your applicants, and to have the same group of people looking at the people, and again, in forms of in terms of performance managing, find the people that have the strengths that you want. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Anything further? Um, Har Simon Franco. Heartened to hear um, your focus on diversity, and I don't know how closely you followed the debate in this town over the past uh, two years about um, increasing the diversity of the town's workforce. Uh, I'm wondering to sort of add to Selectman DeWitt's uh, comments, if you've given any thought to or had any experience with inc increasing diversity, uh, not necessarily at the senior most level, but, but sort of at the front line, um, day-to-day uh, -day, uh, worker level uh, and, and maybe ways that we in town could do a more effective job of that whether partnering with um, local colleges and universities or um, other uh, civic organizations any thoughts on that um, that topic that's a great question I think certainly partnering with civic organizations and universities um, establishing a diversity council and really raising the awareness for all the workforce to volunteer and be part of it because I think often the people close, 
closest to the work have the best ideas. So really creating a form that people can volunteer and offer. Anything further? Well, thank you very much for your interest in this. We're not making a decision tonight on it, but okay. I think you're very well qualified. And thank you very much. Good night. Uh, calendar item number 11 is a um, presentation from our um, co-chairs of the Climate Action Committee, Selectman Wyshynski, remotely, and Deborah Rivers, there she is, uh, to present an amend amendment to the charge for the committee. So uh, I'm not sure which one of you is planning on going first. Well, I think Neil was going to briefly introduce the subject. I'll, I'll start Great. Yes, that's okay. Go ahead, Neil. Maybe give him a microphone. I, I took over as one of the co-chairs of this Selectman's uh, Climate Action Change Committee when I was first elected. And since that time, the committee has been going through a, a, a transition. Um, we, we came off our successful participation and leadership in, in the Solarize project. And since then, um, we, uh, we've, we've been going through kind of a, a, a soul searching exercise, uh, looking at what should be, uh, what should one, what should be our next big project, and two, what should be the focus of the uh, committee going forward. And uh, out of that process, uh, one is our new co-chair Deborah, Deborah Rivers, who's, who's before you, and, and, and two is a proposed new charge uh, which is uh, before you, and we hope that uh, uh, you'll uh, uh, vote that charge and, and, and give the give the committee uh, it, it, its new direction. And I'll turn it over to uh, Deborah to explain it and, and go into a bit more detail in, as to what we're trying to do. Okay, I just wanted to point out two major differences from the existing charge, which is at the top of the page. And the, the first one was to bring all our efforts into alignment with the uh, Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act. And I think that makes sense because, you know, the state has set goals under the Patrick administration and they're good goals and a lot of success has already been achieved and we thought that aligning with that made sense. The second item, which is the second bullet, Point, and this is something that I particularly recommended, um, is to look into um, climate adaptation or resiliency. And um, this is a particular interest of mine. I, I worked on the new Spalding Rehab Hospital, which has been cited in the new Boston Climate Action Plan for its resiliency. And I was very concerned uh, when I joined the committee, and I've been on the committee about a year and a half now, uh, about what Brookline was doing. And um, much to my pleasant surprise, I went to a hazard mitigation plan um, public hearing back last March, and a lot is being done. And I want to invite all of you uh, on Thursday evening at the library to attend a session uh, as part of Climate Action Week to just see what uh, the region and the town are doing in response to that. But this is something that I have promoted and I think is very important because no matter how much we reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Climate change is already happening, and we need to be prepared to respond to those effects as well as continue to mitigate our emissions. Um, the other things you can read, and you know, if you have issues with the language, I mean, this is your committee uh, and the charge, but we felt like we wanted to update and strengthen the charge. We are also now, just, just to let you know, um, looking at all the action items in the climate action plan that was finalized in December 2012. So I'll just leave it at that and if you have any questions I'd be happy either Neil or I to answer those. Good. Questions board members? All right. If you don't mind I'm just almost finished rereading it. <laughs> <laughs> well I, can I then say that sure. uh, I did read through it, and I find the um, the proposed uh, charge seems perfectly compatible. Um, I'm not familiar with the the um, state program to know, you know. I but I I trust that you guys are creating something that uh, fits. So therefore, um, that makes a lot of sense to me. You can look it up, um, but it's it's a very comprehensive program and. Uh, a lot of specific measures follow it, and 
we are doing a lot of things that already that uh, um, are in response to that. Right, and um, I, I know that we are pursuing green communities yes. and walkability and many other, uh, let's call it related, uh, sympathetic, uh, appropriately uh, activities and policies. Right, and we will be uh, doing our annual report. We're a little late. Normally we do it for the fall town meeting, but we will be doing it for the spring town meeting. And we're also in the process of updating the climate action plan, which uh, uh, hopefully then we'll be able to put that on the website. So uh, again, you know, a climate action plan is not a static thing. It has to keep evolving once we know more about what's going on. And so. All right. Anything further? Further questions? All right. I'm going to say, uh, I was just, just uh, the reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 80% in 35 years is, is ambitious. But I'm trying to picture what the town will look like with 80% lower greenhouse well, gas. Well, picture what the town and the country may look like without it. I mean, that's my answer because, I mean, the, the science continues to be... Uh, more and more alarming as t in terms of the effects of what's going on. So well, I, I think, think our, we our, do our recent best. snow, um, our recent snow is probably backing you up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think you're going to see far, far more solar arrays, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, one thing I'm also encouraged by, uh, Mayor Walsh convened a regional conference of, of uh, about 13 cities and towns within the Boston region to attend a conference in uh, April because this isn't a town by town thing. I mean, we really need to act as a region, and Brookline is participating in that. And um, also, I, I just um, you'll be happy to know um, that the Metropolitan Area Planning Council is very much involved in helping towns, especially towns like Brookline that don't have the financial resources that the city of Boston has to devote to this. But it's interesting, uh, I was meeting with my panelists like a couple of weeks ago and everybody said, well, Brookline's a small enough ship that you can actually turn it around as opposed <laughs> to something like Boston. So I think that we can really be an exemplar. And um, we certainly have a lot of people in town that are working hard to you know, make things happen. And I think we've made great progress towards that 80% goal. You know, it's been a commitment of this board and, and, and the administration to, uh, where possible, um, to mitigate our, our emissions of greenhouse gases. So uh, certainly a lot of work left to do, but uh, we've made uh, tremendous progress. And I think uh, this committee and, and your work and Slepin Wyshynski's work are a testament to that. And much appreciated. Yeah. And I'd also like to just point out, I have um, tomorrow evening, David Lescoyer, who's also a member of our committee, is having uh, a session on community solar, which for people who can't put solar panels on their roof um, is a, an interesting alternative. So if you're available, uh, that's also worth um, going to. Right. And, and I can say that um, in the conversations uh, ongoing about the Devotion School, um, where we will certainly, the school will be constructed at, with a solar ready roof. One of the possibilities to talk about is how that program might be um, integrated. I, I, I don't know for sure at all at this moment in time, but simply to say, not necessarily for um, private individuals, but it may very well be a way that the town can take advantage of that opportunity to reduce our uh, consumption and costs. Right. Good. All right. Well, thank you to the committee for all the thought that went into uh, devising this, this uh, amended charge. And uh, Slavon Wyshynski, do you want to make the motion remotely? I think you better go Do we, do we lose him? I think we lost him. Neil, are you there? Well, sorry about that. I had the mute on. Oh, okay. um, Motion for the... Right. I'd like to move that uh, the selectmen accept uh, uh, the, the Climate Action Change Committee's proposed uh, motion. Amended, amended charge. Great. Uh, all in favor say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman DeWitt? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. And chair votes aye. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, next calendar item is a review and discussion of our override and debt exclusion questions. Tonight's discussion is really meant to be a chance to um, well, debrief a little bit after our public hearings, talk about uh, in general terms where we, where we see this going, um, discuss the s schedule for actually taking a vote on a, on a, uh, on a um, Override question. question. Ballot and question. Ballot question. Thank you, and um, and discuss any any interim steps that people might want, uh, members might want before we uh, actually get to that vote on the ballot question. Um, my own impression is that uh, we had a very robust and uh, very uh, I think accurate cross section of of the town at our recent hearings. I think we heard the, the viewpoints. I think they were well expressed. Um, and my impression is that we are close to the point where we can vote a ballot question. Uh, in a perfect world, I'd like to see that happen at our next meeting, which is next week, but I don't want to uh, yeah, I think it, I don't want to jump the gun either. I am going to be gone the following week, so I would request that we do have our vote next week. OK. Well, I, I, I didn't realize we were going to be meeting on school vacation week, so. I'm going to be away and out of the country. We certainly want you to be here. I, I actually have something I would like to bring up with regard to the schedule, and I don't know if you want to start with that. Yes, but why don't you go ahead, because I right? think that's a threshold question. Okay. I know what you're going to um, ask. Uh, uh, what, what I have, um, and I'm going to ask Mr. Kleckner uh, to confirm that I'm right, um, we originally we're thinking that we needed to have the language of the ballot question approved really in time for the financial plan um, and I'm going to ask Mr. Kleckner to explain how he plans to prepare the financial plan with the assistance of Mr. Cronin who will not quite be gone yet um, and Melissa Goff um, but I know he will have several scenarios and uh, I also know that we frequently get additional financial information later in February, early March. The state, actually, Mr. Franco may have some comments about this. The state tends to be able to provide us with um, better uh, updates and projections about what local aid will be. Um, so I am posing, without personally advocating one way or the other, that we consider whether or not we must vote the ballot because, or it must do it next week, because once we have put the number in the ballot question, we can't change it. It's fixed. Whereas if we waited, and I believe toward the end of March, Mr. Clark will, will I'm sure, answer my question there, um, we might know more and better uh, what the actual number should be. So I am posing this as something we should be thinking about without necessarily making a strong argument for it, other than to say that I believe in the financial plan, um, Mr. Kleckner and company will surely provide us with a no override scenario. We could hypothetically um, give Mr. Kleckner a uh, number which we consider to be the best we have as of the current time. Um, and then that could be revised with additional information. In other words, what I'm trying to say is once you vote the number for the ballot, it's fixed. That's all. All right? So I'm, I'm raising the question. I'm taking no position. I just want people to think about it. I'm going <laughs> to res respond that I think that there's a lot of um, concern out there as to what we're going to put on the ballot and um, people wanting to understand um, before the May vote um, and I I think we <coughs> sort of owe it to the public to um, figure this out sooner rather than later um, so that the discussion can can go forward on an informed basis. I tend to agree with Selectman Daly on that question as well. Selectman Franco? I'm inclined to agree with uh, both uh, Chairman Goldstein <coughs> and Selectman Daly. Um, and to respond to Selectman DeWitt's comments about additional financial information becoming available in February or early March, uh, and I would defer to, to Mr. Cronin or Mr. Kluckner on this, it's, it's sort of my view that um, 
the governor is going to propose his budget and sort of set a benchmark for local aid and uh, Chapter 70 reimbursements. And, and it won't be until the end of April when the House Ways and Means budget comes out that we'll really have a, a sort of a revised view of, of what, what the legislature may do. And then uh, in May, of course, the, the Senate passes their version of the budget. Uh, so I don't think that you're suggesting we wait until April to, to, to no, put a number. No. Um, so I think the, the information we have now is probably about as good as we're going to get um, in the near term. I've got, uh, I, I do want to know, I know Selectman Wyshynski has uh, been sharpening his pencil and working on uh, his proposal, and in part, speaking of new information, due to slightly higher projections from Mr. Cronin um, as to, I think, local revenues? Right. Um, but I, I've been working with uh, probably mainly uh, Selectman DeWitt in, in going through what was proposed, um, I don't know, I guess three, four weeks ago, as uh, we're calling, we've been calling it Plan 2, um, and, and looking at uh, each, each of the line items, and then working with uh, 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 you know, Sean and, 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 and Mel to kind of sharpen figures. And, and, and we've discovered that we can raise the projected local revenue, the uh, local revenue growth um, by a factor of something like 178,000. And, and we also found that uh, town administrator Kreckner committed to uh, 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 raising more in non-tax revenue that, than we had uh, uh, put into the original proposal. So there is a revised plan to, I think we're calling it plan four before you, uh, which actually lowers the amount of the override uh, by about 400 and Seventy-something thousand dollars to a figure of seven million six six four, which yields a four point two one percent levy increase. So that is the revised plan two that 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 is before us right now. I I just wonder. I I see Miss Wolf Ditkoff in the back of the room and. I don't know if, Neil, you've had a chance to have discussions with her, but I wanted, uh, in addition to um, some higher um, uh, projections on local revenue, I, th I think you, you're also contemplating s some cuts to um, the, the, the number uh, that would go to the s some that you think that the schools can operate effectively with a little bit less well, than under, we under, the, uh, under plan two, the, the, the net available for the school programs is the same. Now, I've been behind the scenes talking to some folks to see if we can further uh, refine this uh, a little more, um, and I, I don't know if I'm ready to, to raise that yet, um, but, but I will say that uh, I, I, I've been talking with some of the uh, Group 1 folks um, to see if, if, if there was some way that we could uh, come up with one number that wouldn't be quite as uh, divisive as I perceive uh, 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 an adherence to, a complete adherence to the Group 2 methodology. Yeah. So I, I've been doing some of those explorations, but I, I, I don't know if I'm ready to uh, uh, go public with that yet. Okay, and I, I would just like to be very clear that the, um, the proposal that Selectman Wyshynski um, has been discussing basically starts with the uh, calculations made from the override study committee's group 
two, group two, I hope I have it right, right. Uh, the larger number, uh, it doesn't change the, from that estimate, it does not change the number of positions. The changes that are incorporated have to do more with the assumptions about additional revenue. Um, it does include, and I know there were some questions, just the uh, things that have come up, so I, I will I identify some of the issues that have come up. Um, it basically adopts the um, group's recommendations for staffing. Um, it adopts the group's recommendations for special education and educational technology. Um, it actually, and I, I think this is one of those cases where um, there's, there's been a genuine effort to try to be accurate and at the same time um, worry a little bit about where, which is the right number. Um, Override study used a 1% collective bargaining number. We among ourselves have talked about <coughs> a 2% number and Selectman Wyshynski has used a 1.5% number which is basically splitting the difference, all right? So that's a change. Um, but mostly it is really based on the recalculation from, um, from Sean Cronin over what available would, what would be available under the town school partnership revenues and uh, an update on uh, the town administrator's estimate of where we can either generate revenues or have efficiencies. So those are actually the big changes, but it starts from the higher number and the, um, I will say, and I, I wish to recognize and thank Selectman Wyshynski for having put this through a really rigorous review. My own feeling is that it's quite fair to the proposal that we got from the override study committee, but adds additional information that wasn't available to them. Right. So, I want to say that um, that I don't want to see the override be a penny higher than it needs to be. I think you you heard me on that, and a few minutes ago when we talked about the uh, the. Um, including the snow equipment in it. Uh, having said that... Yeah, this does not include any snow equipment, I will have to say. <laughs> have, having said that, um, I, I, what I got from our public hearings loud and clear is that a, a substantial majority of, of the town, uh, or at least the, the, the ones who came out to speak on it, and the ones, most of the ones who have emailed me as well, uh, are in favor of the idea of giving the schools what they need to be successful and not uh, applying any, uh, any, any discounts to, 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 to what, the, what the number is. And uh, so I'm all for, if, if Selectman Wyshynski uh, has got some new assumptions that we can put into the mix here regarding uh, revenues or, or uh, other um, places where we can sharpen our, our pens and pencils to uh, to, to further, you know, refine the the uh, amount of, of, of expenditure that needs to be done. I'm all for that. I'm also uh, of the belief that compromise is not a dirty word, and I would much rather do this with a consensus among this board. And um, but you know. I'm starting from a point, and I think you said this a moment ago, just like to it, unless I misunderstood, misunderstood you. We're starting at a point from the higher number, um, and, and that's where I would entertain some, some cuts, some additional revenues to be considered, and, and some, some compromise to, 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 to get a consensus. So um, and that, that's where, where I hope this board is going, and I'm hopeful that the rest of the town will follow. Um, so with that in mind, I, I would like to um, at least work towards the, towards the, the uh, possibility that we're going to have a vote on a ballot question for next Tuesday night. And what I'd like to see happen before that is that maybe if everybody on this board works to, to, to get to me or to Mr. Better, better yet, to Mr. Kleckner before Friday, you know, where they stand, what, what, what they, they'd like to, to see on that ballot. Uh, then when we plan our, our, um, 
our agenda for next week, we can take a, a look at that and, and see if there's see if there's room for that for that kind of consensus vote to take place. How does that sound to everybody? Neil. Yeah, I think you have to be careful yeah, about yeah, violating I, the open meeting law with that approach. But well, no, I've done. Uh, I, 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 so I can feed it into Mr. Kleckner right, and Daly Mr. Kleckner can point. re redistribute things. Right. So Selectman Daly raises that that might you know we have to be careful of the open meeting law, and I agree with that. But that's why I think to Mr. Kleckner, and that's why I think that it will uh, you know end up being a a, a uh, an amalgamation of those those votes without having uh, any offline discussions between any more than, than two board members either. Uh, can, can I just throw something totally different in? But uh, I did, and I want to acknowledge uh, Peter Rowe and um, Bill Lupini. Um, I had a series of questions having to do with collective bargaining uh, for the schools, which was uh, many people have raised questions and, and are curious and concerned. What is a step? What is a lane? Okay, now I know what steps and lanes are. And as a result, um, here are some background, which you may or may not want to have. I mean, we don't have to discuss it tonight. It's just something to take away that will, I hope, help inform our conversation as we go forward. Um, and I also um, followed up with um, our Human Resources Department uh, just because my suspicion is that if you look at all collective bargaining agreements, steps and lanes actually seems to be a well um, accepted uh, way of discussing both uh, seniority, longevity, and uh, additional educational achievement in school collective bargaining. It's true across the country. It's used all across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, there are some people who believe that it should be changed because the original model is really probably more based on industrial collective bargaining and teaching as a profession, and I'm not even going to get into that. But some communities have begun to redefine um, these concepts and use different language. Uh, but my point is that if we think about it in our other collective bargaining, um, we also provide educational incentives. We also have acknowledgement for seniority, longevity in positions. And steps and lanes are not that different. And if you look at any particular collective bargaining agreement, you would probably be overwhelmed with how many different components they are made up of. And so I just don't want us to get distracted into somehow thinking that steps and lanes are, and I don't, want, I don't even want to fill in a value judgment here, but why they should be somehow thought of as not the same as collective bargaining across the board, because they're not that different, really. In fact, in a funny way, you could argue it's pretty transparent what they are. You may disagree with the numbers, but the concept as you think about it, if you look at the um, materials, um, is is pretty clear. So that's my little piece of educational information. Thank you. I just wonder, since she's here, I just have a couple of questions for Ms. Wolf Ditkoff. Ms. Wolf Ditkoff, are you willing to subject yourself to Ms. Daly's questioning? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have heard some discussion about your contingency um, line and and personally I will say I, I spent many years on the town school partnership and I do remember there were some years ago where there, the schools didn't seem to have much contingency in their budget and it was, it was a problem because it meant they had to come to the reserve fund for everything. But maybe you can give us, educate us a little bit as to how you use that contingency and, and you know, what, it, what you consider it to be for and how valuable it is. So I'm happy to. I mean, it's uh, Susan Wolf-Tickhoff, Chairman of the School Committee. I'm, I'm happy to. We, we have Peter and Bill here, so I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer. But the short okay, well, whoever you want to hand it off to is fine. Do you want to do 
Peter? And there, there's a one sentence answer. I don't know how much depth you want, but essentially we use contingency for a few reasons. One is for special education costs. One is for growth and enrollment that outstrips um, the projections, and there are many others, but those are the two most common. Oh, I'm getting nods, two nods behind me. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we've already had a lot of discussion about your math and literacy specialists and those kind of things, but um, tell us a little bit about the administration piece of things. Tim, you want to do that one? So um, there's a number of components in the model that we've created. Uh, a number of them uh, have to do with building level administration. Um, as you know, uh, a number of factors other than enrollment have changed. Um, we have a new uh, law regarding educator evaluation. Um, we've, we've had to add vice principals at uh, elementary schools, not only because those elementary schools have grown, but because, um, I mean, <laughs> essentially our evaluation uh, law changed to a once every two years to a once a year model. So the number of evaluations essentially on principles doubled overnight um, each year. Um, we've, uh, uh, early on in the override study committee process, we were told there would be uh, outside study of, of elements like our central administration, because the central administration is essentially the same size as it was when we were 2,000 students, smaller in a much more simple time for public schools. That didn't happen in that process. We were disappointed but that didn't happen in that process. Um, we went to the school committee and, and asked to be able to do uh, that process. We've, we've engaged with the Collins Center um, to, to look at our central administration. Um, we essentially, as I've said to you a number of times, we, um, we added a number um, that we thought, uh, as we've looked at other like size, equally complex school systems, seem to lay out some of the positions that we thought we were missing compared to some of those districts, um, given the service that people here expect of us. Um, but the specific recommendations um, we're, we're receiving back from them now, the school committee will actually hear from them next Thursday, and we met with them today. Um, so those are, the, those are essentially the administrative um, pieces that we, that we laid out in the model. Thanks for the question. Well, I, I have one other question, too. On the, um, you know, we've had some discussion about collective bargaining and what to assume on that, and obviously the negotiating team has to sit down and do the hard work of, 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 the, of the collective bargaining and come to some, um, some resolution. So if we're just um, hypothesizing numbers and we get it wrong, um, what's the what's the effect how do you how do you handle that within the budget uh it comes from program um it it would it would need to come from teachers professional learning uh, other elements that we've added to this model that you factor into the number um uh, it, it would it would come from somewhere else which is what happens with with collective bargaining right um so we, we believe in November we gave you ample evidence as to why two was the appropriate number given the districts that we compare ourselves to, EDCO communities largely, but a, but a broader section across the Commonwealth. And we still believe that number is the appropriate number, just as the towns use that number in your projections. We believe that's the appropriate number to factor into our next three year projections. Um, I have one final question. It's about the old Lincoln operating costs. Um, that I think they're estimated at six hundred and seventy-nine thousand. And is that annually? I pr probably so. Is, yeah. Let me explain what that is and it isn't. Yeah. Okay. So what it isn't is teachers from Devotion who will move from Devotion to Old Lincoln School. They're factored into our present budget. They continue to be factored in. This is this is the cost to the school, essentially. So this is a vice principal. This is a custodian. This is a secretary, um, and and then it gets a little bit more complicated because when you when you split a school, whether you split it initially as two grades, right, or in the second year you split off four grades, 
there are pieces that don't split cleanly. So you might have someone who's teaching world language at the building, and they might be teaching both in the elementary program and in the middle grades. Very difficult to, to split. So there's some factor for those pieces as well. Um, we've actually uh, done and we'll, and we'll talk with the, the Finance Committee on Monday morning and with the School Committee next uh, Thursday about the specifics of, of that. But it, but it is right in, in that neighborhood of, of those costs that are in addition to the people who presently work with us. And maybe while you're still there, Dr. Lupini, um, just because not everybody understands, I know you floated a couple of different models about how a Lincoln might be used, but would you like to tell us now the, the current and I assume ongoing uh, expectation? So the, the final model that we will use for, <laughs> and that we're in the process of implementing, thank you for the question, um, for, uh, for devotion at Old Lincoln, as we're calling it now, um, is that next year our seventh and eighth graders will move to that building. Um, they will five be, sections. They no, will, that's not. Five well, sections. it's not. It's not five sections. I don't remember. It's yeah. three or four. I, right. think, I think they might be fours. Um, I think they're all fours. Is that right? Here? Yeah, they're all fours. fours. And the following year, um, for the duration of the project, because that's when the project actually begins, the construction project, um, we'll move fifth and sixth grade to join them. So that'll be a five through eight building for the duration. Five through eight building made up entirely of devotion school students for the duration of that project. Thanks. At least three years. So is this 679? Excuse me. I'm sorry. sorry. I need to correct that. Depends on actually whether we're able to move the K through four. If oh, we're able yes. To move the K through four, as we discussed with the devotion community last week, we actually save a year. That would be uh, great. In there. Um, that would be a goal um, for us, something we're, we're, we're continuing to pursue and expect to hear on some bids um, around the 17th of, oh, of that's February. right. Um, so actually what Dr. Lupini is saying is that the school department issued an RFP uh, looking at additional space. And my personal goal, and I'm very grateful to uh, Dr. Lupini and colleagues for really aggressively pursuing this, is to have no children on the site during construction, which will reduce the cost of the project and also reduce the number of years um, and will definitely be preferable to everybody. That's right. And we should, we should know sometime this month if we have something that we can pursue. So is this 679000 the cumulative cost of, uh, of the old Lincoln relocation or is it assuming? It's, it's if you will, the startup cost. In other words, to put two custodians, a secretary, a librarian, a guidance counselor in the building, we'll add that in year one. Then as we grow in the next year, you don't need to add to those, you know, the nurse, the custodians. So it, it gets that building open. <clears throat> so it's a year one cost. There'll be incremental changes to it, but, but they're it's, not it's significant. A, it's an additional facility. facility. It's additional right. school facility. Right. And it's a great question in that, in that we've looked at all of these models. If you remember back to the original models that took us through 2022, this cost goes away at some point, right? This, this particular cost goes away. It, however, is replaced if, we, if, if, we follow, if we're able to follow through on the plans we have to use the building for high school space. It is replaced by some associated cost, some like cost associated with the high school. Very good. Okay, so unless there's something further, you know, I'm going to conclude this by saying that, it will, you know, I'd like for each of us to get to Mr. Kleckner a, uh, a proposal of how they think this ballot question should look, and that our uh, agenda planning meeting later this week, we will, you know, first of all, Mr. Kleckner and I will communicate with you for anything that we, we don't understand about the proposal, but we will put a ballot question together. Uh, and then that doesn't mean that that's the end of the discussion either. Next Tuesday night, we will publicly discuss that that uh, that proposal, and if we can reach a consensus among that board, we'll vote it. And if we can't, and we need to delay it further, uh, which is not my preference, then that's what we'll do. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Good. Uh, so I'm going to conclude our uh, discussion of the override now and move on to our calendar item number 13, which is fiscal year 16 budget objectives. At this point, we've uh, 
been through the listing of budget objectives a couple of times now. Yeah, we uh, got thrown off by the snowstorm, um, yeah. but we have not gone to print, so I just need a final vote from the board on the uh, budget objectives in front of you. Okay. Anything further to discuss about the no, budget objectives? I think we've covered it now. Excellent. So I move that we approve the fiscal year 2016 budget objectives uh, in accordance of, with the document that uh, begins on section well, page 12-2 of our packet and ends on 12-4 of our packet. All in favor? Is there further discussion on this? All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman DeWitt? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Turn aye. Off, turn off the mute. <laughs> Uh, Selectman Franco? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And uh, finally, we have a uh, question of making appointment to the Tree Planting Committee. I turn the microphone over to Mr. Kleckner. Mr. Chairman, the uh, Tree Planting Committee is made up of three individuals. I think you know we've had uh, questions about how that might be expanded. We, we may not expand the voting members of the committee without legislative approval since this committee was created by a special act of the legislature. There is an opportunity for the board, if it wishes, to create uh, non-voting um, uh, associate members. Uh, that's, that's allowed in, in the bylaws for any committee, I guess. Uh, but we haven't made that decision. So at this point, we do have um, a, a retiring or ex expiring term with the incumbent uh, prepared to uh, submit their, their interest. And then we also have um, a vacancy with two candidates, two additional candidates. So I'm just going to go through them in, the, in this order. And afterwards, I think the board could have a discussion about whether it may want to um, establish a non-voting member. Um, <clears throat> so the, for, the, um, uh, for a vacancy or for an expiring term, expiring in 27, Nadine Gertz. Aye. 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 For the uh, vacancy expiring in uh, 2016, Elizabeth Erdman. Aye. Catherine Adams. So Ms. Erdman is, uh, will fill Mr. Schmidt's vacancy. Good. Yes, so I, I would like to, to uh, move that we make an associate member um, on this committee. Can I just or tell whatever you, whatever well, we have to call you know, it? Non-voting associate. Non -voting be a non-voting associate. associate. Um, I had uh, conversations with the um, current tree planting committee members and what they requested was that they have an opportunity to meet with the new appointee and simply discuss the matter of non-voting alternates which they found could be um, somewhat confusing in a very small group so they were wishing that they would have a chance to meet the new member and have a meeting to talk about it before this board took any action Okay, I uh, will withdraw my motion. Okay. But personally, it, make, it makes a lot of sense to me that you have someone who's getting trained for a slot. Secondly, it is such a small committee, it would be someone who might be able to do some work uh, for them. I, if, I, I, have, I have had that conversation, and they, I think, just want a little time to not just think it through, it may also be that they've been doing it the way they do it for a very long time and okay. so. So I agree with Selectman Daly that, that we should take it off and give them the, 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 the ability I, I would to do hope that. that they but I also have, would like yeah. to stress to them yeah. that we think this is a good I, idea. I have, I have done that. Uh, I've said very clearly, it seems to me it's a way of having people who can um, be prepared to move in when a vacancy occurs and I think their biggest issue had to do with how a non-voting member would participate. I just think they have to think it through. In your conversations, was there a timeline discussed as to when they were going to think this through and well, come back to us? Well, as of tonight's appointment, they'll have their next scheduled meeting and then presumably after that. I think they meet at least once a month, if, if not more frequently. I, I didn't really ask correct. them that, but certainly the next scheduled meeting. And you yeah. might point out that there's a very well-qualified candidate yeah. for that as yeah. well. So. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for your attention. Bye. Thank you, Selectman Wyshynski. <laughs> Safe trip home. Yeah.